Act One of The Mind the Paint Girl by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Persons of the Play Viscount Farncum, read by Thomas Peter. Colonel the Honorable Arthur Stidolph, read by Alan Mapstone. Baron von Rettenmeyer, read by Nemo. Captain Nicholas Jays, read by Campbell Shelp. Lionel Roper, read by Brad. Tham de Castro, read by Aaron White. Herbert Ferguson, read by Frédéric Surgé. Stuart Heniage, read by Kevin S. Gerald Grimwood, read by April 6090. Carlton Smythe, manager of the Pandora Theatre, read by James Thomas. All But Pock, actor at the Pandora, read by Sandra Schmidt. Wilfred Tavish, actor at the Pandora, read by Philip Watson. Vincent Bland, a musical composer attached to the Pandora, read by Todd. Morris Cooling, business manager of the Pandora, read by Jim Locke. Luigi, maître d'hôtel at Catanis Restaurant, read by Pierre. The Honorable Mrs. Arthur Stadolf, formerly as Dolly Enzer of the Pandora Theatre, read by T.J. Burns. Lily Paradell of the Pandora, read by Foam. Jimmy Birch of the Pandora, read by Sonia. Gabrielle Cato of the Pandora, read by Pauline Latournerie. Enid Moncrief of the Pandora. Read by Leanne Yao. Daphne Durr of the Pandora, read by Emma Hatton. Nita Trevena of the Pandora, read by Lex Hankins. Flo Conifee, one of four beauties of the Pandora, read by Eva Davis. Sibyl Dermot, one of four beauties of the Pandora, read by Abai. Olga Cook. One of Four Beauties of the Pandora, read by Devora Allen. Evangeline Ventress, One of the Four Beauties of Pandora, read by Elsie Selwyn. Mrs. Upjohn, Lily Paradell's Mother, recording by Tracy Duckett. Gladys, Lily's Parlor Maid, read by Eva Davis. Maud, Lily's Maid, read by Lian Yao. Stage Directions, read by Larry Wilson. The action of the piece takes place in London, at Lily Paradell's house in Bloomsbury, in the foyer of the Pandora Theatre, and again at Lily's house. The curtain will be lowered for a few moments in the course of the second act. Mind the Paint Girl, Act One. The scene is a drawing room, prettily but somewhat shoyly decorated. The walls are papered with a design representing large clusters of white and purple lilac. The furniture is covered with a chintz of similar pattern, and the curtains, carpet, and lampshades correspond. In the wall facing the spectator are two windows, and midway between the windows there is the entrance to a conservatory. The conservatory, which is seen beyond, is of the kind that is built out over the portico of a front door and is plentifully stocked with flowers and hung with a valerium and green sunblights. In the right-hand wall there is another window, and nearer the spectator a console table supporting a high mirror, and in the wall on the left, opposite the console table, there is a double door opening into the room, the further half of which only is used. In the entrance of the conservatory to the right there is a low oblong tea table at which are placed three small chairs, and nearby on the left are a grand piano and a music stool. Against the piano there is a settee, and on the extreme left below the door there is an armchair with a little round table beside it. At the right-hand window in the wall at the back is another settee, and facing this window and settee 
there is a smaller armchair not far from the fireplace there is a writing table with a telephone instrument upon it a chair stands at the writing table its back to the window in the wall on the right and in front of the table opposing the settee by the piano there is a third settee on the left of this settee almost in the middle of the room is an armchair and closer to the settee on its right are two more armchairs other articles of furniture a cabinet occasional chairs etc etc occupy spaces against the walls on the piano on the console table and cabinet on the settee at the back on the round table and upon the floor stand huge baskets of flour and other handsome floral devices in various forms with cards attached to them and lying higgledy piggledy upon the writing table are a heap of small packages several little cases containing jewelry and a litter of paper and string the packages and the cases of jewelry are also accompanied by cards or letters a fierce sunlight streams down upon the valerian and through the green blinds in the conservatory note throughout right and left are the spectators right and left not the actors lord farncombe his gloves in his hand is seated in the armchair in the middle of the room he is a simple-mannered immaculately dressed young man in his early twenties his bearing and appearance suggesting the soldier he rises expectantly as gladys a flashy parlour-maid in a uniform shows in lionel roper a middle-aged individual of the type of the second-class city man hello i'm in luck just the chap i'm hunting for shaking hands with farncombe how do you do lord farncombe how are you roper gladys to roper languidly i'll tell mrs upjohn you're here ta gladys withdraws phew it's hot miss paradell's out roper taking off his gloves she won't be long i dare say i've brought her a few flowers have you i've sent her a trifle of jewellery farncombe glancing at the writing-table she seems to have received a lot of jewellery roper bustling across to the table by jove doesn't she ah there's my brooch i didn't consider i'd a right to offer anything but flowers on so slight an acquaintance exactly but i'm an old friend you know turning to farncombe perhaps by her next birthday farncombe smiling i hope so roper approaching farncombe and taking him by the lapel of his coat what i want to say to you is doing anything to-night i i shall be at the theatre oh we shall all be at the theatre to shout many happy returns later i mean nothing that i can't get out of good look here smythe is giving her a bit of supper in the foyer after the show a dance on the stage to follow about five-and-twenty people will you come if mr smythe is kind enough to ask me he does ask you through me he's left all the arrangements to me and maury cooling carlton never did anything in his life i egged him on to this i've been sweating at it since eleven o'clock this morning haven't been near the city not near it well farncombe his eyes glowing i shall be delighted splendid been trying to get on to you all day i've called twice at your club and at st james place sorry you've had so much trouble roper dropping on to the settee in front of the writing-table and wiping his brow there'll be the baron sam de castro bertie fulkerson stew hedidge jerry grimwood dwarf kennedy colonel and mrs stidolf dolly enza that was and ourselves besides cooling and vincent bland and the pick of the company catani does the food and drink i don't believe i've forgotten a single thing with a change of tone pointing to the armchair in the middle of the room sit down a minute farncombe sits and roper edges nearer to him are you going to wait to see lily this afternoon i i should like to because if jay should happen to drop in while you're here captain jay's nico jay's or if you knock up against him to-night at the theatre mum about this about the supper roper nodding mm. 
"'We don't want Nico Jays. We simply don't want him. And if he heard that you and some of the boys are coming, he might wonder why he isn't included.' "'He strikes me as being rather a surly, ill-conditioned person.' "'A regular loafer.' "'He appears to live at Catani's. I never go there without meeting him.' "'Exactly. Catani's in a top back bedroom in German Street, and hanging about the Pandora, that's Nico Jay's life.' "'He's an old friend of Mrs. Upjohn's and Miss Paradell's too, isn't he?' "'Roper evasively.' "'Known him some time. That's it. Lily's so faithful to her old friends.' Barncombe smiling. "'You oughtn't to complain of that.' "'Oh, but I'm a real friend. I've always been a patron of the musical drama. It's my fad. And I've kept an eye on Lily from the moment she sprang into prominence.' "'Mind the paint, mind the paint. Looks after her like a father. Uncle Lal, she calls me. Reassuringly. "'I'm a married man, you know.' Barncombe nods. But the wife has plenty to occupy her with the kids, and she leaves the drama to me. She prefers Bexhill. Leaning forward and speaking with great earnestness. Farncombe, what a charming creature. Mrs. Roper? No, 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 Lily. Oh, and so's my missus, for that matter, when she chooses. But Lily Upjohn. Beautiful. Perfectly beautiful. "'Yes, and as good as she's beautiful, you take it from me.' "'With a wave of the hand. "'Well, if you see Jay's, you won't—' "'Not a word.' "'Roper rising and walking away to the left. "'I've warned the others.' "'Returning to Farncombe, who has also risen. "'By the by, if Lily should mention the supper in the course of the conversation, "'remember, she's not in the conspiracy.' "'Conspiracy?' "'To shunt Nico. We're letting her think there are to be no outsiders. Barncombe becoming slightly puzzled by Roper's manner. Why, would she very much like Captain Jays to be asked? Oh, Roper rather impatiently. Haven't I told you once you're a friend of Lil's? Looking towards the door. Is this Ma? Mrs. Upjohn enters. Hello, Ma. Mrs. Upjohn, a podgy little gaily dressed woman of five and fifty, with a stupid, good-humoured face. Hello, Uncle. Lord Farncombe. Mrs. Upjohn advancing and shaking hands with Farncombe. Glad to see you here again. You have been before, haven't you? Last week. Of course. You came with Mr. Bertie Fulkerson. But somebody or other's always popping in. Pleasantly. Lil sees too many, I say. It's tiring for her. Won't you set? Lord Farncombe's brought Lily some flowers, Ma. To Farncombe. Where are they? Farncombe, who, after waiting for Mrs. Upjohn to settle herself upon the settee in front of the writing table, sits in the chair at the end of the settee, pointing to a large basket of flowers. On the piano. Mrs. Upjohn barely glancing at the flowers. How kind of him. Such a waste of money, too. They do go off so quick. Roper reading the cards attached to the various floral gifts. Where is Lil? She's setting to a rising young artist in Fitzroy Street. Claude Morgan. She won't be home till past five. So tiring for her. Never heard of Morgan. No, nor anybody else. That's what I tell her. Why waste your time giving sentence to a rising young artist when the big man would go down on their hands and knees to do you? But that's Lil all over. She's the best-natured girl in the world. And so she gets imposed on all round. Farncombe gallantly. I prophesy that Mr. Morgan's picture of Miss Paradell won't have dried before he's quite famous. Mrs. Upjohn turning a pair of dull eyes full upon him. How do you mean? Barncombe disconcerted. Er, uh, I mean... Why won't it have dried? I mean he will have become celebrated before it has dried. His pictures never do dry, you mean? No, no, Ma. However, it doesn't matter. He isn't even going to put her name to it. 
Why not? You may well ask. He's bent on calling it the Mind the Paint Girl. What's wrong with that? Everybody will recognize who that is. Mrs. Upjohn unconvinced. Her name's printed on all her photos. The first time I had the pleasure of seeing your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Upjohn, a man next to me said, Here comes the Mind the Paint Girl. Mrs. Upjohn cheering up. Oh, well, perhaps young Morgan knows his own business best. Let's hope so, at any rate. Roper by the tea table, beckoning to Farncombe. Farncombe? Farncombe to Roper. Eh? To Mrs. Upjohn, rising. Excuse me. Farncombe joins Roper, whereupon Mrs. Upjohn goes to the writing table, and seating herself there, examines the jewelry delightedly. Roper to Farncombe in a whisper. Do me a favor. Certainly. Roper looking at his watch. It's only half past four. Take a turn round the square. I've some business to talk over with the old lady. Farncombe nodding to Roper, and then coming forward and addressing Mrs. Upjohn. I, um, I think I'll go for a little walk and come back later on, if I may. Mrs. Upjohn contentedly. Oh, just as you like. Farncombe moving towards the door. In about a quarter of an hour. If we don't see you again, I'll tell Lil you've been here. Farncombe at the door. Oh, but you will. You will see me again. Well, please yourself and you please your dearest friend, as Lil's dad used to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. He disappears, closing the door after him. Mrs. Upjohn to Roper, looking up. I believe you gave that young man the end to go, Uncle. I did. Told him I wanted to talk business with you. Business? Resuming her inspection of the trinkets. This is a handsome thing, Mr. Grimwood Center. Roper, his hands in his trouser pockets, contemplating Mrs. Upjohn desperately. Upon my soul, Ma, you're a champion. Now, what have I done? Well, you might spread yourself a little over young Farncombe. Spread myself? Why should I? Lord Farncombe. I treat them all alike. So does Lil. He's not the first title we've had here. Not by a dozen. No, but damn it all, I, I beg your pardon. This is up John beaming. So you owe, swearing like a trooper. This chap's in love with her. Oh, they're all in love with her. Or have been one time or another. Yes, but they're not all Farncombs, and they're not all marrying men. I'm prepared to bet my boots that if Lil and young Farncombe could be thrown together... Sitting on the settee in front of the writing table, as Mrs. Upjohn rises and comes forward. Here, do talk it over. Mrs. Upjohn, placidly. Where's the use of talking it over? It's wasting one's breath. Moving to the settee by the piano. My Lil doesn't want to marry. Anyhow, not yet a while. She's happy and contented as she is. Sitting and smoothing out her skirt. When she does, I suppose it'll be the captain. Roper, between his teeth. The captain. Ma, the day Lil marries Nico Jays, you and she'll see the last of me. Oh, don't say that, Uncle. I do say it. The disappointment would be more than I could stand. Selfish, designing beggar. Now, no low abuse. A fellow who gets on the soft side of Lil before she's out of her teens, before she's made any position to speak of, and when she has made a position, and he's practically on his uppers, sticks to her like a limpet. She sticks to him, too. It meant a deal to Lil in her humble days, recollect, receiving attentions from a gentleman in the army. She doesn't forget that. Roper jumping up and walking about. It's cruel, that's what it is, it's cruel. Here's Gwenny Harker and Mady Travail, both married to Peer's sons, and Eva Shafto to a baronet, all of them Pandora girls, and Lil, she's left high and dry, Engaged to a nobody. It's cruel. She's not actually engaged. Ho, ho. 
The idea was when he shirked going to India and gave up soldiering so as to be nearer that he should get something to do in London. Then they were to be engaged. Roper sarcastically. Oh, to be just, I admit he's in no hurry. He's been a whole year looking for something to do in London, looking for it at Catani's and at the Pandora bars. He has to be on the spot at night to bring Lil home after her work. Exactly. And when a decent, eligible young chap comes along and means business, he's choked off by finding Nico Jays in possession. Stopping before Mrs. Upjohn. But I say. What? Farncombe hasn't tumbled to it yet. Mrs. Upjohn indifferently. Hasn't he? Bertie Fulkerson's held his tongue about it. So have the other boys who are friends of Farncombe's. They see he's hard hit. Oh, they're good boys. They're good, loyal boys. There's not one of them who wouldn't throw up his hat if Nico got the chuck. Ma. Mrs. Upjohn startled. Hey. This little spree tonight at the theatre. Lil thinks it's merely among the members of the company. Ain't it? Roper sitting beside her. You keep quiet now. No, it isn't. Ooh. The boys and Farncombe. Mrs. Upjohn disturbed. Gracious, there'll be an awful fuss with the captain tomorrow. Roper snapping his fingers. Psh! Mrs. Upjohn rising and walking away to the right. He's so horribly jealous. When Lil tells him who was at the party, there'll be a frightful kick up. Roper falling into despondency. Oh, I dare say I'm a fool for my pains, Ma. Nothing'll come of it. Rising and pacing the room again. Farncombe's as shy as a schoolgirl. He'll be on a desert island with a pretty woman for a month without squeezing her hand. Mrs. Upjohn in an altered tone. Uncle. Hello. Mrs. Upjohn thoughtfully. I shouldn't raise any objection, bear in mind, if Lil could be waned away from the captain and took a fancy to young Farncombe. Objection? Mrs. Upjohn sitting on the settee in front of the writing table. All said and done. To be Lady F with no need to work if you're not disposed to is better than being Mrs. Captain J's and having to linger on the stage, perhaps till you drop to help keep the pot a-boiling. Opening her eyes widely. Lady F. Roper coming to her. And Countess of Goldming when his father dies. I suppose there'd be any amount of unpleasantness with the family. Roper disdainfully. The family. There's generally a rumpus in such cases. Why, Ma, these tip-top families ought to be jolly grateful that we're mixing the breed for them a bit. Look at the two lads who've married Gwenny Harker and Mady Travail, Kinterton and Glenroy, and Faucus, Sir George Faucus, Eva Shafto's husband. They haven't a chin or a forehead between them, and their chests are as narrow as a ten-inch plank. Quite true. Farncombe himself, he's inclined to be weedy. I maintain it's a grand thing for our English knobs that their slips of sons have taken to marrying young women of the stamps of Mady Travail and Gwenny Harker, or Lil, keen-witted young women full of the joy of life with strong frames, beautiful hair and fine eyes, and healthy pink gums and big white teeth. Sneer at the Pandora girls. Great Scott, it's my belief that the Pandora girls will be the salvation of the aristocracy in this country in the long run. Captain Nicholas Jays lounges in. He is a man of about five and thirty, already slightly grey-haired, who has gone to seed. Roper sits in the chair in the middle of the room rather guiltily, and Mrs. Upjohn puts on a propitiatory grin. Jays nodding to Mrs. Upjohn and Roper as he closes the door. Afternoon, Mrs. Upjohn. How are you, Roper? Ah, oh, Captain. Hello, Nico. Jay's advancing. Lily not in? No, she's in Fitzroy Street, setting to Morgan. Jay's frowning. Why didn't she ask me to go with her? Dunno, I'm sure. She's took Miss Patch. <sighs> oh? Looking round. Flowers. Heaps of them ain't there. Roper jerking his head towards the writing table. Yes, and some nice presents over here. She's beat a record this year, Lil as. Oh, no. 
Jeeves goes to the writing table, and Roper and Mrs. Upjohn rise and wander away, the former to the conservatory, the latter to the settee by the piano. Jeeves scowling at the presents. Very nice. Picking up a case of jewelry. Very nice. Throwing the case down angrily. Confound him! What the devil do they take her for? Roper at the entrance to the conservatory. I may remark that one of those gifts is from me, Jays. Oh, I'm not alluding to you. Much obliged. Jays coming forward and addressing Mrs. Upjohn. I've called in to ask Lily whether she'll come out to supper with me tonight to Catani's to celebrate her birthday. Luigi's decorating a table for me specially. Mr. and Mrs. Linthorne will come, and Jack Weathert. To Roper. Are you free, Roper? Mrs. Upjohn sits uneasily on the settee by the piano, and Roper finds some object to interest him near the tea-table. I suppose it's no good asking you, Mrs. Upjohn. N no thank you, Captain. And I... I'm afraid... Afraid? I'm afraid Lil can't manage it either. Why not? I, I'm surprised she didn't mention it to you herself when you brought her home last night. Mention what? They're giving her a supper tonight at the theater. The theater? Roper advancing. Yes, Carlton standing a little spread in the foyer in honor of the occasion. Sitting at the tea table. Quite right, too. She's his best asset and chance it. When was it fixed up? Late last night. The fact is, Lily and I had a slight tiff coming home last night. Sitting on the settee in front of the writing table. Ha! Huh, I suppose she kept it from me to pay me out. Sharply. Who's invited? Um, only the principal members of the company, I understand. Mrs. Upjohn moistening her lips with her tongue. Yes, only the members of the company, Lil says. With Maury Cooling and Vincent Bland thrown in. Jeeves looking at Roper. You seem to know a lot about it, Roper. I was behind when Morty was going round to the dressing rooms. Jeeves to Roper suspiciously. Are you asked? Eh? Are you asked? Roper with an attempt at airiness. Oh, yes. They've dragged me into it. Since when have you been a member of the company? No, but... Dash it, I've done business for Carlton in the city for twenty years or more. That doesn't make you one. And I'm an old friend of Lil's. Not older than I. Violently. Why the blazes doesn't Smith invite me? Roper extending his arms. My dear Nico, I'm not giving the party. Really, you do jump down a man's throat. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Leaning back and thrusting his hands into his pocket. Well, I'll put Jack and the Linthorns off. They don't want to sup with me. I shouldn't amuse them. Gazing at the carpet. Her birthday, though. It'll be the first time I shall have been out of that for... How many years? Six years, I... Raising his head, he detects Mrs. Upjohn and Roper eyeing each other uncomfortably. Anything the matter? Th the matter? Jeez, taking his hands from his pockets and sitting upright. Any game on? Game? At my expense? I don't know what you're driving at, Captain. Jeez, harshly. How long's Lily sitting this afternoon? Till five. Jeez, looking at his watch. What's Morgan's number in Fitzroy Street? Sixty. Jeez, rising. I'll fetch her. As he makes a movement towards the door, it is thrown open, and Lily Paradell enters with a rush. An entrancing vision of youth, grace, and beauty. She is followed by Jimmy Birch, a petite, bright-eyed girl in an extremely chic costume. Lily tearing off her gloves as she enters. Phew! I'm dead! Giving her hand to Jeeves carelessly. Ah, oh, Nico. To Mrs. Upjohn. I couldn't stand the heat in the studio any longer, Mother. Finding Roper beside her, she offers her cheek to him, and he kisses it. Mon uncle. Jimmy closing the door. That young man Morgan ought to paint the infernal regions. Lily taking her scarf from her shoulder. He might finish with the angels first, though. To G softly as Roper turns to shake hands with Jimmy. 
you in a better temper today? Jeez, in her ear. You drove me wild last night. Lily making a face at him. Served you right. Passing him. For God's sake, let me lie down. She throws herself upon the settee in front of the writing table, and Jeeves moves away as Mrs. Upjohn and Roper go to her. Don't come near me. Give me my fan. Jimmy, where's my fan? Oh, I've left it in Fitzroy Street. Beast! Mrs. Upjohn hurrying to the writing table. There's one here, among your presents. Lily unpinning her hat. Uncle Lel, what an adorable ring that is you've sent me. Roper taking the fan from Mrs. Upjohn. Ring? A brooch! Somebody sent me a ring. Mrs. Upjohn sitting in the chair at the end of the settee by the writing table. There's three rings. Of course. One of them's from Nico. To Jeeves. Did you get my sweet telegram, Nico? Jeeves, who has greeted Jimmy and is now seated at the chair on the extreme left, sulkily. I had your telegram. But it's a pendant I sent you. Jimmy, sitting upon the settee by the piano and pulling off her gloves. <laughs> you shut up, Jimmy. Snatching the fan from Roper. How on earth am I to remember? Fanning herself. Who's given me this pretty thing? Mr. Monty Levine. Bless him. He's a dear little man, though he does bite his nails. Gladys appears with Vincent Bland, who saunters in after her. Seeing Lily, Gladys advances to her. Hello, Vincent. Bland, a thin, delicate-looking man of eight and thirty, not over-smartly dressed, wearing an eyeglass, nodding to Lily casually. You needn't have cut me. Almost on your doorstep. To Jimmy and Jeeves. Hello, Jimmy. Hello, Nico. Gladys viewing Lily with an elevation of the brows. Oh, are you home? Lily returning Gladys's stare. Apparently. I'll whistle up to Maud. Don't, if it's too severe a strain on you. Mrs. Upjohn to Gladys as the girl moves to the door. Gladys, we'll have tea. Gladys at the door. You can't till it's ready. Lily calmly. Cheek. Gladys retires. Bland, who has strolled across to Lily indolently. Why do you retain the services of that tousle-headed hussy? Lily with conviction. Oh, she's a little under the weather, but she's a perfect servant. Bland to Mrs. Upjohn. Ma, you look blooming. Wish I could return the compliment, Mr. Bland. Bland to Roper, who is wearing a waistcoat of rather a pronounced pattern. Congratulations on your waistcoat, Lal. Roper joining Jimmy, annoyed. Now no personalities. Lily giving Bland her hand. Vincent, yours is one of the loveliest presents I've had today. Remorciement. How's that for a French accent? Bland dropping his eyeglass. You cat. Why? You know I've given you nothing. Not even a penny nosegay. <laughs> Lily raising herself on her elbow. On my honor. Vincent, dear, I swear I thought... The funds are too low. Replacing his eyeglass. I did go so far as to price a bangle at Selby's. But that was before a certain event yesterday. What horses did you back, Vincent? I won a fiver to Jerry Grimwood. Roper to Bland. You are a patient ass. Why don't you leave betting alone? Bland to Roper, flaring up. Why don't you leave your city muck alone? Lily putting her feet to the floor imperiously. That'll do. Be quiet, you two. I won't have any wrangling in my house. Run away and play, all of you. I want to speak to Vincent for a minute privately. With a gesture. Uncle Lel, Jimmy, Nico? To Mrs. Upjohn. Scoot, mother. Oh, dear. What a child. Roper, Jimmy, Jeez, and Mrs. Upjohn move away, and Lily beckons to Bland. Finn. Bland close to her with a wry face. Mercy. You've broken your word to me, then. 
through her teeth. Those damned horses. Cooling had a tip from the stable. Cooling? Maury Cooling has no children, only a fat wife. You've a darling little wife and three kiddies. How much did you drop yesterday? Shan't say. Lily rising and touching his arm. Oh, Vincent. She looks round to assure herself that she is unobserved. Mrs. Upjohn and Roper are seated at the tea table with their heads together, talking. Jimmy is at the piano, fingering out a piece of music. Jeeves is half hidden in the armchair, facing the settee at the back. Lily tiptoes to the writing table and seats herself there as Gladys reappears, showing in the Baron von Rittemeyer. Von Rittemeyer, a tall, fair young man of three and thirty, speaking in thick guttural tones, advancing to Lily. Ah, goddess. Gladys withdraws. Many happy returns the day. Hush, I'm busy for a moment, Baron. Von Rittemeyer to Lily, shaking hands with Bland. A thousand pardons. Talk to Mother and Jimmy. With pleasure. Going to Mrs. Upjohn and Roper and shaking hands with them. How are you, my dear Ma? How are you, Jimmy? Waving a hand to Roper and Jeeves. My dear Roper. My dear Nicholas. Jimmy to Van Rittenmeyer, mimicking him. Roper, Nicholas. Why don't they provide you with throat lozenges at the embassy, Baron? Von Rittenmeyer laughs. Lily has quickly opened the drawer in the writing table and produced a checkbook. After another glance over her shoulder, she sweeps the presents aside and writes. Then she replaces the checkbook, rises, and returns to Bland. Again there is a loud guffaw from von Rittemeyer in response to some sally of Jimmy's. Lily to Bland, folding the check and slipping it into his hand. Promise. Promise you won't make another bet. Bland and folding the check. Your check? Put it in your pocket. A blank one? Don't fill it in for more than you can help. I'm not over flush. He deliberately tears the check into four pieces, and looking at her steadily, puts them into his waistcoat pocket. Bland as he does so. I'll keep those, Lil, for as long as I keep anything. You fool, Vincent. My dear, as if. Such ridiculous pride. Stamping her foot. Lord, what I owe to you. Gladys enters with San de Castro. Gladys is carrying a lace-edged tablecloth, which, assisted by Mrs. Upjohn, she proceeds to lay upon the tea table. Bland moving away to join the others. To de Castro. Ah, Sam. De Castro, a stout, coarse, but genial-looking gentleman of forty, of marked Jewish appearance, speaking with a lisp, shaking hands with Lily. How are you today, Lil? Many happy returns once more. Thanks, dear old boy. Sitting on the settee in front of the writing table. Did I send you a wire this morning? Not you, not a sixth penorth. I ought to have done so, to acknowledge your... what was it? A ring. Diamonds and sapphires. Ah, oh, yes. Beautiful. It is rather a nice ring. Lowering his voice. But, I say... What? Mind you don't go and tell Gap on any account. Lily, with a great assumption of ignorance, raising her eyebrows. Gabs? Gabriel, Miss Cato. Why shouldn't I? Nonsense. You know very well. Urgently. You won't, will you? Lily shrugging her shoulders. I won't, if I remember not to. The castle alarmed. Ah, now! Don't be stupid. What's the good of making mischief? Lily shows him the tip of her tongue. Oh, Lil! Gladys goes out. Lil! Von Rittenmeyer, leaving the group at the back and putting an arm round de Castro's shoulder. My dear friend Zom, how are you, Baron? Going to Mrs. Upjohn. Afternoon, Ma. Nodding to Jimmy and Roper. Afternoon, everybody. Shaking hands with Jeeves, who has risen and now joins the group. 
How are you, Nico? Lily giving her hand to Van Rittenmeyer. Excuse me for cutting you short when you came in. Thanks for your splendid present. I did send you a wire, didn't I? Van Rittenmeyer kissing her hand and bowing over it. I shall preserve it with a few auto souvenirs till the end of my life. Lily withdrawing her hand and blowing the compliment away. Phew! La, 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 la. Von Rittenmeyer in an altered tone after a cautious look round. Goddess? Eh? Von Rittenmeyer anxiously. My drifting little offering. I entreat you not to mention it to Enid. <laughs> oh, another of you. Dear charming Miss Mungrief. Baron, I wish you boys wouldn't make me presents, and then ask me to keep them a secret from the other girls. And I, I wish it were not necessary. But, goddess, you are also a young lady of the world. You know what women are. Hm, huh. I know what you men are. Maud, a buxom young woman with a good-tempered face, dressed as a lady's maid, enters quickly, tying her apron, and runs to Lily. Jeeves comes to the further side of the writing table, and von Rittenmeyer now joins him there. Jimmy Birch also comes forward, accompanied by De Castro. Maud to Lily. Here, give me your things. Lily tosses her hat, scarf, and gloves to Maud. I was in my room having a lie down. Is my hair untidy? I've never seen it anything else. <laughs> Maud to Jimmy and De Castro. Afternoon, Miss Jimmy. Afternoon, Mr. Castro. To Lily. Now, don't let them all tie you to death. There's a pet. Oh, clear out. As Maud is departing. Hi. Rising and kicking off her shoes and sending them in Maud's direction. Fetch me a pair of slippers. Maud picking up the shoes and chuckling. <laughs> when Maud reaches the door, which she has left open, Gladys appears with the tea tray and with Farncombe at her heels. Gladys to Maud. Oh, you're doing something, are you? Yes, setting you an example, my girl. Encountering Farncombe. Beg pardon? Maud withdraws, closing the door, and Farncombe stands looking at Lily, who is talking to Jimmy. Gladys carries the tray to the tea table. Lily, becoming aware of Farncombe's presence and nodding to him. How'd you do? Farncombe moving a step or two towards her. I... I've been here before this afternoon. I ventured to bring you some flowers. Lily going to him and shaking hands with him formally. Nobody told me. Awfully kind of you. Where have you put them? Farncombe lifting his basket of flowers from off the piano and showing it to her. Here. Yeah. Pretty. Pulling out a carnation. Stick it up there again. He replaces the basket. You're Lord Farncombe, aren't you? Yes. Lily with a glance at the others. Know anybody here? Farncombe looking round the room. Nearly everybody, I fancy. He advances to von Rittenmeyer, who comes to meet him. Lily sits upon the settee by the piano and fastens the carnation in her dress. Gladys goes out. Carl! My dear Eddie! Farncombe bowing to de Castro, who is now seated beside Jimmy on the settee in front of the writing table. How are you, Mr. de Castro? To Jeeves, who is standing by the chair at the writing table, gnawing his mustache and watching Lily and Farncombe sourly. How are you, Captain Jays? Turning to Bland. How are you, Mr. Bland? To Lily. I've been talking to Mrs. Upjohn and Mr. Roper already. Lily looking across to Jimmy. Miss Birch, Lord Farncombe. Jimmy nodding to Farncombe. How do you do? Farncombe going to Jimmy and shaking hands with her. I... I needn't say that I am one of Miss Birch's warmest, most profound... Jimmy smiling at him. That's all right. Don't you bother about that. Maud returns, carrying a pair of silken slippers. Von Rittenmeyer, who has come to Lily, makes a dart at the slippers and takes them from Maud. Ah, permit me. Now, Baron. Slapping his arm. <laughs> he pushes Maud out of the room, she resisting laughingly, and closes the door. Von Rittenmeyer, holding the slippers aloft, 
gentlemen, homage to beauty. Valo me, Zam, Vincent, Robert, Nigo, Eddie. The men put themselves behind him in single file in the order in which he calls them, with the exception of G's, who deliberately sits at the writing table, and Farncombe, who is embarrassed. Jimmy claps her hands, and Mrs. Upjohn, who is pouring out tea, laughs herself into a fit of coughing. Ta ta ra ra ta ta boom boom. Baron, you great baby. Queek, Marge. Roper calling to Farncombe. Come along, Farncombe. Jimmy giving Farncombe a shove. Go on. Farncombe takes his place behind Roper, and headed by von Rittenmeyer, the men march around the room. Von Rittenmeyer waving the slippers in the air and singing. Weib was is in all the welt, der an schon heit gleich gestellt, reit zum flossen wunder hult, perl der schopfung herz in gold, tags gedanken traum der nach, schweben um dick suze sack. Von Rittenmeyer halts before Lily and kneels to her. She extends her left foot, and he kisses her instep and puts her foot into her slipper. She rewards him by lightly boxing his ears. He makes way for de Castro, handing him the other slipper, and de Castro performs the same ceremony with Lily's right foot. She upsets de Castro's balance by a little kick. Von Rittemeyer seating himself beside Jimmy, singing, Venus, seinen Nachen boit, der den Sklave. De Castro gathers himself up and sits in the chair at the end of the settee in front of the writing table. Bland and Roper, having knelt and kissed Lily's foot, also sit. The former in the chair in the middle of the room, the latter in the chair on the extreme left. Finally, Farncombe finds himself before Lily. He looks at her hesitatingly, and she returns his look with awakened interest and withdraws her foot. Lily shaking her head. No, no, don't you be silly like the others. Mrs. Upjohn loudly. Tea! Bland, von Rittenmeyer, and de Castro jump up and go to the tea table, where Farncombe joins them. Gladys enters, carrying a stand on which are a plate of bread and butter, a dish of cake, etc. Roper takes the stand from her, and the girl retires. Farncombe brings Lily a cup of tea. The Castro and Bland follow him, the one with a milk jug, the other with a sugar basin. Von Rittenmeyer carries a cup of tea to Jimmy, and then De Castro and Bland, having waited upon Lily, go to Jimmy with the milk and sugar. Roper hands the bread and butter and cake to Lily, then to Jimmy, and in the end Roper, Bland, De Castro, and Von Rittenmeyer assemble at the tea table and receive their cups of tea from Mrs. Upjohn. Roper relieving Gladys of the stand. Give it to me. I want a little exercise. Lily taking her cup of tea from Farncombe. Thanks. De Castro helping Lily to milk. Milk ho! Sugar? <laughs> I'm putting on weight as it is. Roper offering the bread and butter, etc., facetiously. Ices, sweets, or chocolate, full piano score. Nothing to eat, Uncle. I dine at six. Mrs. Upjohn calling to G's from the tea table. Catmate, you going to have any tea? G's moodily examining the presents on the writing table. No, thank you, Mrs. Upjohn. Bland to Jimmy after she has been helped to milk. Sugar. Two lumps. Roper pushing Bland and Castro aside, imitating a female voice. Ices, sweets or chocolate, full piano score. Jimmy cutting a slice of cake. Well, the world would be a much happier place to live in if Lloyd George texts your jokes. Von Rittenmeyer, Bland, and De Castro returning to the tea table. Lily <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> to Farncombe, who remains standing near her. Seen our show at the Pandora? Farncombe gazing at her. Twenty-three times. Not really. This week and last, every night. Lily running her eye over him. You and the guards, by any chance? Farncombe nodding. Yes. Lily smiling. Ah, uh, 
you'll never do a braver deed than seeing our show twenty-three times jimmy as roper leaves her to go to the table her mouth full of cake boys <coughs> oh wait a minute i've swallowed some of the baron's german gulping <coughs> boys seriously no rot raising her teacup jolly good health to lily there is a cry of approbation from bland von rittemeyer de castro and roper farncombe fetches himself a cup of tea from the tea-table she's a white woman lily is the staunchest truest pal where she takes a liking here 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 here, here, here. mrs upjohn pressing forward through the men and going to lily and the best daughter breathing embracing lily and then turning to the others do you notice the new dress i'm wearing this afternoon don't mother don't fifteen guineas it cost her sitting in the chair on the extreme left proudly madame godolphin made it and an act to go with it on sweet lily to mrs upjohn Hush. well sipping her tea as if drinking a toast in a cup of tea bland de castro and roper sipping their tea in, in a, a cup, cup of tea. tea von rittemeyer drinking in a gobo tea jimmy to von rittemeyer mockingly <laughs> gobo dee lily waving her hand thank you jimmy thank you dear boys from the bottom of my heart jimmy to the men by jove she saved me once from going home to a cheap lodging and taking a dose of rat killer von rittemeyer behind roper and de castro peeping over their shoulders a pity a great pity i'll attend to you presently baron lily to jimmy i remember a wretched little shrimp you looked that day jimmy to everybody it was my first morning at the pandora they'd had me up from harrogate in a hurry to take granny harker's place i'd been playing her part in the number two company in the country and she'd left them in a hole to get married to a stupid lord to farncombe finding him standing near her sorry i was to have only one rehearsal clenching her fist and oh didn't they treat me abominably miss answer was late and we were all hanging about on the stage waiting for her i've never felt so cold in my life or so lonely not a word of welcome not a nod from a single soul simply a blank stare occasionally from a haughty beauty with a curled lip and at last when i was on the point of howling i became conscious that somebody was watching me a tall pretty thing in a lavender frock de castro sitting in the chair in the middle of the room lil i caught her eye and she came straight over to me and sat down beside me shaky she said a corpse i said and she quietly laid hold of my hand and held it till dolly answer condescended to stroll in and when i got up i asked her who she was and she told me oh my god i said i'll never forget your kindness why of course you're the mind the paint girl roper de castro and von rittemeyer singing Mind, mind the paint, mind the paint, paint. tra-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la. Bland seats himself at the piano and thumps out the air of the refrain of Mind the Paint. The three men, mouthing the time silently, wave their arms, and Lily's head and body move from side to side. Uh, is there anything more ancient than a four-year-old comic song? Playing a few bars of the melody of the song shade of the nineveh and all the buried cities roper von rittemeyer and de castro to lily coaxingly lil goddess lily. goddess goddess lil lily shaking her head oh boys it's gone pressing temples i couldn't bland plays the introductory symphony and then pauses then she sings he accompanying her in a moment or two the song comes back to her readily and she gives it with great witchery and allurement g starts up and goes to the window in the wall on the right side and looks out lily singing 
i've a very charming dwelling you know where without the telling decorated in a style that's rather quaint smart and quaint when you pay my house a visit you may scrutinize or quiz it but you mustn't touch the paint brand new paint mind the paint mind the paint no matter whether maple's bills are settled or they ain't once you smear it or you scratch it it's impossible to match it so take care please of the paint of the paint rising and coming to the middle of the room lily repeats the refrain dancing to it gracefully jimmy also rises and she roper von rittemeyer and de castro join in the chorus and the dance the three men very extravagantly barncombe looks on enraptured while mrs upjohn beats time with her hands i'm possessed of all the graces oh a perfect dream my face is it may owe to art a trifle or it mayn't hm it mayn't and i'll cry out for assistance should you fail to keep your distance goodness gracious mind the paint mind the paint mind the paint mind the paint a girl is not a sinner just because she's not a saint but my heart shall hold you dearer you may come a little nearer if you'll only mind the paint mind the paint the refrain is repeated as before mrs upjohn rising and taking a share in it then lily drops on the settee before the writing table laughing and holding up her hands in protest no more boys roper von rittemeyer and de castro gather round her applauding her and urging her to continue no 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 more i've had such a stiff day mrs upjohn with sudden energy to everybody out you go all of you out you go jimmy to the men come on let's mizzle shaking hands with farncombe cruel of us to tire her so mrs upjohn tapping von rittemeyer on the shoulder now then baron von rittemeyer shaking hands with lily i'm coming jimmy taking von rittemeyer to the door well come mrs upjohn pulling roper away from lily now uncle roper adjusting his coat mind the paint ma good-bye lil lily as she shakes hands with the castro calling to jimmy good-bye jimmy and von rittemeyer disappear now mr de castro moving with roper towards the door however do you think she's going to get through her work tonight? de castro pausing to comb his mustache quite right ma thoughtlessly and a thupper and a damth afterward th roper turning upon him quickly shh damn fool de castro clapping his hands to his mouth oh they glance at jeeze who hearing de castro's remark has left the window and come forward a step or two. Uh, goodbye, Nico. Uh, good, goodbye. Goodbye. Bland talking to Lily, neither of them having heard De Castro slip. That jingle, an echo of old times, eh? Lily looking up at him. Yes, but not better times than these times, Finn. Bland sadly holding her hand. Ah, Lil, there are so many tunes in life left for you, my dear. Roper at the door with Mrs. Upjohn and De Castro to Bland. Come along, Vincent. Bland joins the group at the door as Farncombe approaches Lily. Farncombe shaking hands with her. Thank you. With fervor. Glorious. Lily reproachfully. For shame. I mean it. Shh. <laughs> lightly see you again some day perhaps ah uh, yes roper calling to farncombe coming our way farncombe roper bland and de castro depart farncombe bows to lily and makes for the door farncombe to jeez good-bye captain jays jeez who has wandered to the entrance of the conservatory where he is now standing with his back to the room half turning good-bye Farncombe shaking hands with Mrs. Upjohn. Delightful. Enjoyed myself amazingly. Mrs. Upjohn graciously. 
Oh, we're always glad when a few folks pop in. He wrings her hand. If they don't overstay their welcome. Naturally. Hurriedly. Goodbye. He vanishes. Mrs. Upjohn remaining at the door. Captain. G's advancing. I just want half a dozen words with Lily, Mrs. Upjohn. Lily to Mrs. Upjohn. Tell Maud to put out my old green frock, mother. I'll be up in a minute or two. Mrs. Upjohn to G's. Now you won't keep her longer, will you? G's, grimly. No, no, I know she won't be in bed till four o'clock tomorrow morning at the earliest. Mrs. Upjohn goes out, closing the door, and G's comes to Lily. So, Smith is giving you a grand feed tonight at the theater, Lil? Lily arranging the pillows on the settee. In the foyer. And a dance, it appears. Lily yawning. Ugh. Lying upon the settee at full length. Who told you, Grumpy? Roper, and your mother told me about the supper. You didn't. Ha ha. You were in such a vile mood last night, coming home. Who will there be to dance with tonight? The men of the company. That doesn't sound very inspiring. Rather school treaty, isn't it? Nobody from outside? No, it's to be only the men in the theatre and the principal ladies. Roper's going. Uncle Lel? Oh well, he's hardly from outside. And to Castro. Sam? I'm sure of it from something I heard him say just now. Sam used to finance Carlton. I suppose they reckon him one of us. G sitting in the chair in the middle of the room. Smith might have extended the compliment to me, Lil. He knows how I stand towards you. Awfully sorry. I can't help it. G's twining his fingers together. You see, if Roper and De Castro are asked, there may be others. Lily changing her position. Oh, la 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 la. G's with a set jaw. Some of the more juvenile boys, perhaps. Examining his nails. Lil. What? When did you make the acquaintance of the young sprig of the nobility who's been here this afternoon? Lord Forncombe. Bertie brought him and introduced him one day last week. Ha! He's at your feet now. Fa. Oh, you may fa. He's in front every blessed night. There he sits. Roby, three stalls from the end, prompt side. There are a few good-looking girls at the Pandora besides your humble servant. Rubbish. His glass follows you all over the stage. I watched him talking to you in this room. Lily raising herself. Did you indeed? Jeez, beating his clenched hands upon the arms of the chair. God in heaven, first it's one, then it's another chasing you. Lily putting her feet to the ground. Oh, you're maddening, Nico. You are. You're maddening. Last night it was Stewie Henny she chose to be jealous of, simply because you'd heard him sounding my praises at Catani's. You almost broke the window of the car you went on so. I confess I object to Hennyage, or any man, raving about you at the top of his voice in a public place. Sakes alive! Why shouldn't Stewie rave about me in a public place if he feels like it? I belong to the public. He might rave about a girl who's a jolly sight less deserving of being raved about, as a girl and an artist, than I am. Well, we'll dismiss Hennyage. Yes, exit Stewie and enter somebody else for you to fuss and fume about. This afternoon it's Lord Farncombe, and tomorrow it'll be a fresh person altogether. One thing to hear you, that I don't know how to take care of myself, and of any poor boy who loses his head over me. Rising and walking away. You're growing worse and worse with your jealousy, Nico. Stop it. I'm surprised at you, after all these years. It's beginning to fret me, and that's bad for my spirits and bad for me in business. At the tea table, grabbing a piece of bread and butter and biting at it. And now you're making me spoil my dinner. Relenting. And that's not good for me either, you brute. Geez, his hands hanging loosely between his knees, sighing heavily. Oh, Lily, Lily. Yes, oh, Lily, Lily. Why, 
Why don't you put me out of my misery? Lily munching. Poison you? Marry me. Lily behind his chair. Marry you? Taking his handkerchief from his breast pocket and wiping her fingers upon it sarcastically. Have you come to tell me you've got some work to do at last? Break it gently, Nico. The shock might be too great for me. Oh, I'd find a billet soon enough, Lil. If only I'd an incentive to hunt for it. Incentive? You had an incentive twelve months ago, when I was willing to engage myself to you, absolutely, if you could obtain a good secretaryship or something of the sort. I have no fancy for a beggarly secretaryship. No, all you've a fancy for, seemingly, is for living on your unfortunate people. Throwing him his handkerchief and leaving him. How a man of your age can rest satisfied with being a burden to others passes my dull comprehension. I, I have been a bit slack, I own. I have been a bit leisurely, but... Lily inspecting some of the flowers about the room. Nico, that pendant, or whatever it is, you've given me. I don't want to hurt you, but I won't accept it. You take it away with you, do you hear? Jeez, not heeding her, weakly. No. I'm in earnest. You remove it off my premises. No. She returns to him. My eldest brother, Robert. Looking up at her. Bob. She nods inquiringly. Bob's at me to go out to Rhodesia to manage a group of stock farms he's interested in near Bulawayo. Oh, why don't you go? Gee's forlornly. Rhodesia, Bulawayo. Looking up at her again with a dismal smile. Come with me. Don't be absurd. Gee's rising and putting his hands upon her shoulders. No, you wouldn't care a straw. Not a brass farthing if I did go, would you? Lily, softening again. Stuff. I should miss you horribly. Toying with a button of his waistcoat. Who'd bring me home from the theatre at night, then, and from rehearsals? Who— Ah, who? His grip tightening on her. Who? Lily wincing. Sss! You'll bruise my skin if you're not careful. Jeez, taking her hand and crumpling it in his. Well, it might be that you'd miss me for a while. The old dog that you're accustomed to find lying on your doormat. Pressing her hand to his lips. But you don't love me, Lil. Not even as much as you did a year ago. You don't love me. Lily with a faint shrug of her shoulders. Perhaps I don't in the way you mean. Wistfully. Perhaps it's not in me, really, to love anybody in a marrying way. Meeting his eyes. Still, as you say. As I say. Lily pursing her mouth at him winningly. I'm accustomed to you, Nico. He draws her to him. But with a laugh she checks him by offering him her head to kiss. There. Putting the point of her finger playfully on the crown of her head. You may there. As he kisses her. Now I must run upstairs, or mother will whack me. Jeez, detaining her. Won't you allow me to fetch you after the dance? Three or four in the morning? No, I'll give you a rest. Uncle Lal or Sam will take on your job. Going to the door. And don't try to see me tomorrow. Jeez, sharply. Why not? Not till you turn up at night as usual. I shall be a shocking rag all day. Jeez, breaking out. Yes, I expect you'll manage to enjoy yourself thoroughly and dance yourself off your feet, whoever your partners may be. Lily willfully. Expect I shall. Tossing her head up. <laughs> I'll do my best. She departs, leaving him standing near the tea table. He takes out his handkerchief and mops his brow. As he does so, his eyes rest upon the telephone instrument on the writing table, and he stares at it. He hesitates, as if struggling to resist an impulse. Then he goes quickly to the instrument and puts the receiver to his ear. Geez, after a pause. Gerard, three, eight, four, eight. Discovering that Lily has left the door wide open, he lays the receiver upon the writing table 
and goes to the door and shuts it. Then he returns to the writing table and again listens at the receiver. Is that the office of the Pandora Theater? Suddenly imitating the voice of de Castro. Is Mr. Morth cooling in? I'm Mr. de Castro. Sam de Castro. Gone, is he? Oh, is that you, Mr. Hickson? Yes, you'll do. About the supper party tonight that Mr. Smith is giving to Miss Paradell. You're there? I didn't quite understand whether it's to be at the theater or at restaurant. At the theater? Oh, yes. A large party? Oh, that is nice. Who are the guests, do you know? Yes. Yes. Oh, and the boys? Oh, some of the boys are coming, are they? Hey, haven't got the lift from Mr. Roper yet? Oh, he's been helping to get it up. Oh, we shall have a splendid time. The boys. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Goodbye. He replaces the receiver and stands looking at the door for a moment. Then, with his head bent and his hands clasped behind him, he goes slowly out. End of Act One. Act Two of The Mind the Paint Girl by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The scene is an artistically decorated refreshment saloon, or foyer, on the first circle floor of a theater. The wall facing the spectator is paneled partly in glass and through the glazed panels the corridor behind the circle and the doors admitting to the circle are seen. The right-hand wall is paneled in a similar way, showing the landing at the top of the principal staircase and an entrance to the corridor. Some music stands and stools are on the landing, arranged for a small orchestra. In the right-hand wall there is a double swing door giving on to the landing, and in the wall at the back, opening on to and from the corridor, there is a single swing door on the left and another on the right. The left-hand door is fastened back into the saloon by a hook. Between the two doors in the back wall runs the refreshment counter. In one of the further corners of the saloon, there is a plaster statue representing the muse of comedy. In the opposite corner, a companion figure of dancing. In the wall on the left, the grate hidden by flowers, is a fireplace with a fender stool before it and on either side of the fireplace there is a capacious and richly upholstered armchair. A settee of like design stands against the wall on the right between the double door and the spectator. The counter is decked out as a sideboard, and at equal distances from each other there are four round tables laid for a supper party of twenty-six persons. There are eight chairs at one table and six at each of the others chairs being of the sort usually supplied by ball caterers. The saloon and the landing without are brilliantly lighted, the corridor less brightly. Luigi and four waiters, one of whom has a curly head and a fair beard ending in two flamboyant points, are putting the finishing touches on the laying of the tables, while Morris Cooling, a person of imposing presence, displaying a vast expanse of shirt front, is engaged in placing upon each of the serviettes a card bearing the name of a guest. Cooling referring to a plan of the tables which he has in his hand. Miss Conifee, Miss Conifee, Miss Conifee, where's Miss Conifee? Ah, here you are, my dear. Moving to Miss Conifee's chair and putting a card upon her serviette. Next to old Arthur. The four waiters obeying a direction in dumb show from Luigi, go out at the door on the left. 
luigi a little dark active man viewing the tables with satisfaction tables look nice mr cooling cooling absorbed not bad not bad not bad luigi follows the waiters miss cato moving to another table and laying a card upon a serviette gabrielle roper bustles in through the double door in high feather hello cutting a caper merry christmas and a happy new year and how are you to-morrow cooling deep in his plan of the tables hello at lao roper surveying the tables splendid going from one table to another seating em hey mr pog mr pog mr pog placing another card albert which do you make your principal table there it is you're at it ah yes examining the cards miss lily paradell his jaw falling why you've gone and put the baron on her right cooling unconsciously well what's the objection where's farcombe where's lord farcombe on the other side with dolly stidolf and enid rats what do you mean by rats advancing to the principal table nettled look here lao my dear fellow miss paradell is the heroine of the party the seat next to her is the seat of honour that's why i put the baron there with things as they are between england and germany if germany doesn't like it she must lump it lord farcombe's the eldest son of an earl you can't get over that cooling picking up farncombe's card oh have it your own way roper picking up von rittemeyer's card besides the baron sweet on enid just now i'm sure he'd prefer they exchange the cards and rearrange them thanks old man sorry i was shirty cooling laying down his plan and cards and producing a letter from his breast pocket by the by the fair lady the heroine of the party as you call her is in a pretty tantrum over the whole business tantrum cooling unfolding the letter had this from her ten minutes ago listen to this reading my dressing-room eleven fifteen eighty degrees with the windows open in an injured tone ha so i should think roper concerned what's amiss cooling reading more you pig roper whistles more you pig i should feel deeply indebted to you if you would kindly inform me why the devil you went out of your way to deceive me last night you led me to suppose and so did that lying worm lal roper looking at roper you oh lord that lying worm lal roper roper testily all right all right you both led me to suppose that this rotten banquet was to be a family gathering of the ladies and gentlemen of the pandora theatre and no outsiders asked now i find that only three or four of the men of the company are invited and i hear from nita trevenna who has got it from young kennedy that several of the boys are to be laid on for the occasion the result is you have made me tell a regular whopper to a particular friend of mine with regard to this affair roper passing his hand over his brow nico jays which i will never forgive you for morris cooling neither you nor lal roper as true as i am alive i have a jolly good mind not to show but to put on my old rags and go straight home you are too cad so take it out of that and believe me always yours affectionately lil roper walking about well i'm blessed cooling returning the letter to his pocket ha huh? tasty document lying worm and a cad and from miss lily margaret upjohn done anything about it no waited for you going on with his arrangements at the table you're responsible what i did last night was simply to oblige a pal roper irresolutely i'd better run round to her and try to smooth her down hadn't i perhaps you had placing a card mr stuart hennage to roper why you wanted to mislead the girl i can't understand damn it you agreed that that silly brute jays would be a wet blanket you blow hot and cold you do 
there you go more filthy temper if ever i assist in getting up another party as he reaches the door on the left he encounters carlton smythe who is entering at that moment and puts on his humorous manner hello here we are again all change for oxford circus smythe a bulky sleepy-looking man with gray hair a darker mustache and beard and a heavy rolling gait hello i'm just going to have a word with little paradell he disappears and smythe advances cooling approaching smythe how are you tonight, chief smythe a silk hat on the back of his hand an overcoat on his arm regarding the preparations with disgust <laughs> is a muck in the muddle don't worry we'll clear it away in no time shall i tell you who are coming no i shall know soon enough what was the house to-night cooling producing a long slip of paper and handing it to smythe big smythe scans the paper through half-closed lids and gives a growl of contentment ah and the weather dead against us smythe screwing up the paper and cramming it into his waistcoat pocket there's no bad weather for a good play looking at his hands i'll go and have a wash and a brush up luigi returns entering at the door on the left and goes behind the counter the waiters follow him carrying some melons lying upon ice in plated dishes they deposit the dishes upon the counter and luigi proceeds to cut the melon into slices cooling resumes at the table on the left the placing of the cards as smythe is moving towards the right-hand door at the back stuart hinnage and gerald grimwood two exquisitely dressed youths with blank faces enter from the landing smythe shake hands with them ah mr hennage mr grimwood hennage and grimwood murmur some polite expressions excuse me i'm just going to wash my hands de castro enters also at the double door as smythe shakes hands with him hennage and grimwood drift over to cooling who hails them warmly how do sam back in a moment just going to wash my hands de castro detaining him i say carlton eh? i've been in front again to-night magnificent marvellous smythe resignedly oh it'll do i shall get a couple of years out of it there's just one little improvement i'd like to see if i may suggest it what's that de castro linking his arms in smythe you're sure you won't consider me presumptuous of course not very kind of you de castro is my seer if you could give gabth uh, miss cato a tiny bit more to do in the second act smythe nodding ah uh, yes yes she's a little lump o talent that gal if you only realized it a perfect little lump o talent smythe uh, trying to escape uh, i'll think it over will you an extra thong that's all it need be an extra thong oh it would be such an improvement von rittemeyer enters at the double door the waiters now go to the tables and lay a plate with a slice of melon upon each cover ah here's the baron we've been sitting together to-night i and the baron wringing smythe's hand thanks joining cooling and the others on the left as smythe greets von reitemeyer hello morris shaking hands with hennage and grimwood well boys smythe shaking hands with von reitemeyer glad to see you baron so good of you to half me excuse me i'm just going to wash my hands von reitemeyer detaining him pardon me one moment eh? may i take the liberty of indulging in a little criticism on your excellent play certainly von rettenmeyer drawing smythe away from the tables come here his mouth close to smythe's ear the second act second act what's the matter with it the part where the charming miss baradell is changing a costume 
Yes. That is where the beast requires lifting. With a gesture. Lifting. Lifting? Mr. Davish, Mr. Bog, extremely clever. Slipping his arm through Smythe. But if you could see your way clear to give Enid, Miss Mongrief, another dance. A Smythe nodding. Ah, hmm, hmm. It would remove the solitary imperfection. Uh, I'll think it over. Releasing himself. I'm just going to wash my hands. We'll talk about it later. Shonsten Dank. Going to the man on the left. Aha, Mr. Gooling, my dear steward, my dear Jerry. As Smythe is again making for the door on the left, Mrs. Stidolf enters from the landing with Colonel Stidolf. Smythe to Mrs. Stidolf. Ah, Dolly, how are you, my dear? Mrs. Stidolf, a mature but still beautiful woman, gorgeously dressed and wearing showy jewels with a lofty air. How are you, Carlton? Smythe to Stidolf. How do you do, Arthur? Delighted to see you. Lucky I'm able to come to you tonight. It's so difficult to catch me in the season. Been in front? Mm, yes. Oh, yes. What? Don't you like it? Oh, I don't say I dislike it. Shrugging her shoulders. But one can't forget what one used to do here in the old days. Stidolf, an elderly, distinguished-looking man, with a meek voice and a courteous but rather nervous manner. I've had a most enjoyable evening, Colton. So bright, so very bright. Mrs. Stidolf to Stidolf, sneeringly. Oh, anything pleases you. You'd laugh at Punch and Judy. I'm just running away to wash my hands. Looking towards the men on the left. You know von Rittenmeyer? Know him? Why, he was about in my time. Crossing to von Rettemeyer, followed by Stidolf. Carl. My dear lady. Kissing her hand perfunctorily. What bliss. Shaking hands with Stidolf. Call now. Mrs. Stidolf shaking hands with de Castro. How are you, Sam? Ah, Dolly. Hello, Arthur. Cooling presenting Hennage and Grimwood to the Stidolfs. Mr. Stuart Hennage, Mr. Gerald Grimwood. As a Stidolf leaves Smythe, Herbert Fulkerson enters from the landing with Farncombe. In dumb show, Smythe and Fulkerson greet each other, and then Fulkerson introduces Farncombe. Smythe shaking hands with Farncombe. Glad to make your acquaintance. Glad to make yours, Mr. Smythe, and in such circumstances. Fulkerson, a white-haired young man with red eyes of dissipated appearance, espying Mrs. Stiddle. By Jove, if it is a dolly answer, hurrying to Mrs. Stiddle. What cheer, Dolly? Mrs. Stidolf, coldly. How do you do, Mr. Fulkerson? Fulkerson is slightly abashed. Oh, I... I'm pretty middling, thanks. Hope you're the same. Nodding to Stidolf. Evening, Arthur. Vincent Bland has sauntered in at the door on the left and now joins the group surrounding the Stidolfs. Bland nodding to Hennage and Grimwood. Hello, Stuart. Hello, Jerry. Coming to the Stidolfs. Dolly. Colonel. Smythe to Farncombe. I'll be back in a minute or two. I'm just going to wash my hands. Fulkerson calling to Farncombe. Hi, Hetty! Farncombe crosses to Fulkerson and is presented by him to the Stidolfs. Gabriel Cato enters at the right-hand door at the back meeting Smythe as he is going out. The waiters have finished setting the plates of melon upon the tables and now withdraw, carrying the plated dishes and preceded by Luigi at the door on the left. Smythe to Gabrielle. Ah, Gabby, my dear. Quite well, huh? Gabrielle, a pretty young woman with a fretful little face, expressive of extreme dissatisfaction with the world, looking at Smythe spiritlessly. This is a treat. Why, 
you haven't been to see us for ages smythe uh, cunningly i see you all far oftener than you suspect do you that is sly of you smythe leaving her i'm just going to have a wash and a brush up really oh you are full of news he departs as de castro approaches gabriel hello gabth how are you tonight oh i'm all right i suppose isn't it hot de castro not at ease with her it ith inclined that way daphne dure nita tavenna douglas glenn and albert Pock enter at the door on the left nita is a tall handsome girl daphne a plump little fair baby-faced thing they are charmingly dressed as are all the ladies of the pandora theatre glenn and Pock, the latter a short thick-set man who might reasonably be a low comedian are two professional-looking gentlemen of the best class the rivals are warmly hailed by fulkerson von rettemeyer hinnage and grimwood with more reserve by mrs stidolf stidolf has seated himself wearily in the armchair on the nearer side of the fireplace and beyond listening to bland who is talking to him has withdrawn himself from the proceedings fulkerson to farncombe here's daphne dure and nita trevena hello daphne hello nita hiya douglas hello albert how do you do, how do, you bertie? do bertie how do you do vaughn von rettenmeyer kissing their hands dear ladies ah mr glynn mr bock how do you do stewie? how do you do stewie how do you do how do jerry, you do, jerry? Ho, oh, dolly. Oh, dolly that you dolly well girls here i want to introduce lord farncombe miss dure miss trevenor lord farncombe douglas albert lord farncombe nita pouncing upon cooley i say morris what is it my dear is it true that little kennedy's met with an accident yes can't join us the dwarf what's happened ran his car into a bus just outside the theatre oh pitched himself forward on to his head his head don't be anxious nita there's nothing to hurt there poor dwarf gabrielle and de castro now move over to the others hello gabs hello sam ah bertie von rettemeyer kissing gabrielle's hand gabrielle ah von to hennage and grimwood ah boys to mrs stidolf how are you the castro shaking hands daphne nita uh, douglas albert i want to introduce lord farncombe miss cato lord farncombe a band of musicians have mustered upon the landing and there is the sound of the tuning of instruments cooling hurrying across to the double door no 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 music yet wait for miss paradell he reaches the double door roper enters quickly at the right-hand door at the back and seizes his arm eh it's all right she'll be round in a minute amiable angelic she's wearing a new dress and that's taken her mind off it her bark's always worse than her bite i knew it'd blow over roper formidably oh but i have given her such a talking to Gulleen passes through the double door and instructs the leader of the band while roper bustles over to the throng on the left hello imitating a street news vendor special edition cricket piper shaking hands all round dolly nita gabs daphne douglas albert ah here you are farncombe the discovering stidolf hello colonel results piper extra special enid moncrief wilford tavish and sigismund shirley enter at the right-hand door at the back enid is a long spare-figured girl with the lissome walk of a dancer tavish and shirley are tall clean-shaven men of gentlemanlike appearance von rettemeyer makes for enid eagerly and is followed at a more moderate pace by hennage grimwood and de castro and by fulkerson bringing farncombe miss moncrief kissing enid's hand with fervour 
Your dancing was more surprising tonight than ever. To Tavish and Shirley. Ah, my friends. Enid shaking hands with Henry, Grimwood, and De Castro. Well, Stu, how are you, Jerry? Sam! I want to introduce Lord Farncom, Miss Moncrave, Lord Farncom. Roper hurrying across. Hello, here's Enid. De Castro shaking hands with Tavish and Shirley. Peeth went splendidly this evening, didn't it? Fulkerson shaking hands with Tavish and Shirley. I want to introduce Lord Farncom, Mr. Tavish, Mr. Shirley, Lord Farncom. Enid coming forward to greet Mrs. Stiddolf, who advances to her. Dolly, dear! Mrs. Stiddolf embracing Enid. Enid, darling, good gracious, you're becoming an absolute skeleton. Indeed. Well, no one can say that of you. It is a pleasure meeting all you girls tonight. Of course, one can't help seeing changes. Ah, it must be a pleasure, that. I'm going to scold dear old Carlton by and by. He never gave me a birthday party when I was with him. No, and you had so many birthdays here, hadn't you? Cooling returns, entering from the landing, and after looking at the assembly, goes out at the right-hand door at the back. At the same moment, Flo Conifee, Sybil Dermot, Olga Cook, and Evangeline Ventress, four statuesque beauties with impassive faces, enter at the door on the left. Olga is in a dark gown, and Evangeline is wearing a rather elaborate headdress. Instantly, there is a movement in the direction of the new arrivals on the part of Roper, Hinnage, and Grimwood. De Castro and Fulkerson follow, Fulkerson still leading Farncombe about with him. Mrs. Stiddolf turns from Enid, disdainfully, and joins Nita and Daphne at the fireplace. Tavish and Shirley also move to the left, where they come upon Stiddolf and shake hands with him, while von Rettemeyer and Enid, the latter flushed with victory, seat themselves upon the settee on the right. Roper hastening to the beauties. Hello. Show your tickets, please. Room inside for four. Shaking hands. How are you, Flo? How are you, Sybil? How are you, Olga? I say, look at Vanji. The four beauties, as the men shake hands with them mechanically. How do you do? 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 Here, I want to introduce Lord Farncombe, Miss Conify, Lord Farncombe, Miss Dermot, Miss Cook, Miss Fanchi Fantress, Lord Farncombe. How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Cooling hurries back. Cooling to everybody. Miss Paradell. Opening the door and signaling to the leader of the band. Now. The band strikes up the air of Mind the Paint, as Lily enters at the right-hand door at the back, with Jimmy Birch. Lily is dressed in white and altogether fulfills exteriorly Roper's description of angelic. She carries a large bouquet of lilies and pale roses, with a broad ribbon flowing from it. All the men but Farncombe, who holds aloof, press round her, Stiddle rising and joining them. The ladies follow. The men struggling for her hand. Many, many happy, happy returns of the day. Many 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 happy returns of the day. Jimmy battling with the men. Keep away from her. Bertie, you're on her frock. Mind her frock. Mind the paint. Lily holding her bouquet above her head. My roses. Be careful of me, boys. One at a time. Many happy returns of the day. 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 Returns of the day. I want to kiss the girls. Girls. The men make way for the ladies to come to Lily. Many happy returns of the day. 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 
Lily embracing them. Sybil, Nita, oh, Mrs. Sturdolph, Enid, Daphne, Gabs, Flo, dear, Olga, Fanji. Park suddenly. Here's the governor. Smythe enters at the door on the left. Luigi and the waiters are behind him, the waiters carrying trays on which are sugar casters and dishes of powdered ginger. At once there is a movement towards Smythe of everybody except those who have already greeted him, and Lily, who is detained by Roper and others. How are you, Governor? How do you do, How do, you do, do, you do Mr. Smythe? Smythe? How do you do, Mr. Smythe? How do you do, How do, you do, How do, you do Mr. Smythe? How do you do, Mr. Smythe? How, do you do, How are you, Carlton? 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 Smythe in the midst of them all. Girls, girls, I'll shake hands with you all in turn, girls. Thought you were dead. Yes, look at Olga. She's deep in mourning. <laughs> <laughs> Smythe shaking hands. Don't, girls, don't. You're smothering me. Lily, during a momentary lull, finding Farncombe standing before her and raising her eyebrows you giving him her hand carelessly oh it isn't long before we meet again is it smythe huffing and blowing ah uh, that's the lot of them phew where's lily lily here the crowd divides to allow him to advance seeing lily he opens his arms and she goes to him and lays her head upon his breast lil patting her shoulders my dear lily half gaily half tearfully <laughs> carlton god bless you well what about something to eat ready mr smythe ladies and gentlemen supper is ready huh? cooling at the principal table here you are chief miss paradell smythe to lily come along there is a general hunt for places and much hubbub and confusion cooling calling to roper now that's your table roper imitating a shop walker mr roper forward mrs stidolf lord farncombe pointing to another table glenn you're there here you are daphne miss cato wanted gabs stewie baron enid ah cooling to stiddle over there colonel volker said wandering about where am i where am i nita pushing him aside oh be off jimmy cooling at his place at the table olga you're here mr grimwood where am i next to me where is luck screwing up her face at him Oh. Ladies' mantles on the second floor. Where's Sybil? Sib! Sib! The curtain falls, but the music of Mind the Paint continues for a while. Then it ceases, and after a short silence the curtain rises again. The supper tables have disappeared, and the saloon is empty of people. The musicians and their music stands and stools have also gone, and faintly from the distance comes the sound of a waltz. Two settees matching the rest of the furniture now stand at the center of the saloon, back to back, one of them facing the counter, the other facing the spectator. Lily's bouquet lies in the nearer of the two settees, and upon the floor there is a fan, a red rose that has fallen from the lady's corsage, and a pocket handkerchief with a powder puff peeping from it. On the counter there are carafes of lemonade, decanters of spirits, and siphons of soda water, a bowl of strawberries and cream, various dishes of cakes, boxes of cigars and cigarettes, a lighted spirit lamp, and other adjuncts of a buffet. Colonel Stidolf wanders in through the double door as the waltz comes to an end. Feebly and dejectedly he goes to the counter, takes a cigarette, and is lighting it, when Luigi and the waiters enter the door on the left. Two of the waiters are carrying bottles of champagne and wine coolers. Another brings a tray on which are champagne glasses and tumblers, and the bearded waiter follows with a large dish of sandwiches. 
luigi behind the counter to stiddle familiarly ain't you dancing colonel dancing i shaking his head no luigi who speaks cockney english with a slight foreign accent cutting the wire of a champagne bottle why you used to be a regular slap-up dancing man when i first knew you stood off nodding ah um, uh, and moving away my dancing days are done done oh i like that i bet you ain't sixty come now eh what's the time luigi i am got a watch on time colonel looking at his watch twenty to three no later sitting on the settee on the right with a sigh oh dear one of the waiters goes out in obedience to a direction from luigi at the door on the left as hennage enters with enid grimwood with nita von rettemeyer with mrs stiddle at the right-hand door at the back a wisp of hair has fallen over hennage's forehead grimwood looks somewhat downcast and von rettemeyer is obviously bored by mrs stiddle enid to hennage walking across to the left never been to ostend you've never been born then i'm counting the hours to my holiday sitting in the chair on the nearer side of the fireplace hotel de la plage why don't you run over while i'm there nita to grimwood following enid my dear boy i give you my solemn word it wasn't you it was that fool bertie anyhow it's a rotten old frock showing a small rent in her skirt to enid gaily pom para rom pom pom hennage and grimwood go to the counter secure a waiter and return with him to enid and nita the waiter receives his orders and presently fetches the ladies glasses of lemonade mrs stiddle whispering to von rittemeyer well did you ever just fancy von rettemeyer absently looking at enid i beg your pardon fancy those two girls walking into a room before us discovering the fan upon the floor oh i do believe that's my fan von rettemeyer restores the fan to mrs stiddle as roper and gabrielle enter at the door on the left gabrielle to roper in a low complaining voice it's a shame of you that's what it is you went and put lily paradel into rubber and enabled her to make a bit she told us so yes but how long ago that's not the point the point is it's always lily paradel with you you never do anything for us other girls she sits upon the nearer settee in the centre and she and roper he standing by her continue their conversation mrs stiddle to von rittemeyer no thanks i'm on a diet didn't you notice me at supper moving to the settee on the right let's sit to stiddle oh get up stiddle rises quickly why aren't you dancing if you don't dance go home and put yourself to bed you might for all the good you're doing here stiddle with a forced painful laugh ha 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 von rettemeyer as mrs stiddle seats herself plenty of room for you too colonel no no i won't inconvenience you he moves away and von rettemeyer sits beside mrs stiddle the waiter who has previously gone out now returns at the door on the left with a tray of ices in paper cases he goes to the counter for a supply of ice spoons as farncombe enters with lily at the right-hand door at the back her cheeks are flushed her eyes sparkling roper all his attention suddenly directed to lily and farncombe here's lil lily excitedly seizing stiddolf's hand you're not dancing colonel stiddolf showing him her program dance with me i'll make one of the others give up a dance for you stiddolf going to the counter no no i'm too old too old for dancing i shall never be too old for dancing coming to the nearer settee in the centre 
picking up her bouquet and sitting beside Gabrielle. Ah. Uh. Roper to Farncombe, who follows Lily. Hello. Beaming. Jolly potty, hey, Farncombe? Farncombe boyishly. Lovely. To Lily. May I bring you some lemonade? An ice? Lily looking up at him. You may keep on bringing me ices till the music starts again. Farncombe leaves her. Gabby, wasn't that waltz delicious? Pock and Sybil enter at the door on the left. Sybil seats herself beside Nita on the fender stool, and Pock fetches her some refreshment. Gabrielle to Lily drearily. I say, Lil. What? How much did you make out of rubber last year through, Lal? Rubber? 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 Well, I don't know. To Roper. How much? Four fifty. There. I did my house up with it. Gave the job to young Charlie Ramsden, who's gone in for decorating. Yes, and blew the whole lot at one go. <laughs> Blued it completely. <laughs> what does the blue sea whisper to me? Boncombe appears at her side with the waiter, carrying the ices. Ices? Roper leaving Gabrielle, and with his hands in his pockets, walking about exultingly. Ices, sweets, all chocolates, full piano score. Hello here! Yeah. <laughs> Glenn and Olga and De Castro and Evangeline have entered at the right-hand door at the back. Olga and Evangeline seat themselves upon the further settee in the center, and Glenn and De Castro summon a waiter to attend upon them. Shirley and Flo now enter at the door on the left and go to the counter. At the same moment, Smythe, Cooling, and Tabish enter at the right-hand door at the back, Smythe smoking a huge cigar. They also stand at the counter and are served with drinks by Luigi. Lily and Gabrielle, having each taken an ice, the waiter with the ices moves away and offers his ices to the other ladies. Another waiter carries round a tray on which are a box of cigarettes and the spirit lamp, and the bearded waiter moves about with the dish of sandwiches. Some of the ladies light cigarettes, a few of the men take sandwiches. Cooling as he enters with Smythe and Tavish. Ha, 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 you're wonderful, chief to tavish the chief's in great form willie to stiddle colonel listen to the chief mrs stiddle to von rettemeyer confidentially of course this is strictly between ourselves though i almost hinted as much to smith but the fact is the pandora isn't in the least what it was carl nodding is what it was my dear darling and nobody Mrs. Diddle fanning herself. I suppose he can't find the artists. That's it. If you don't have the artists... Shutting up her fan. You recollect my Polly Taggart in The Merry Milliner? Von Rittemeyer stifling a yawn. Charming. Charming. Von Combe is bending over Lily while she is eating her ice, and they are talking lightly but intently. Gabrielle, finding that she is out of it, rises with a pout and, carrying her plate, joins the ladies and men who are at the fireplace. Bland enters with Jimmy at the door on the left. Mrs. Diddle to Von Rettemeyer. I hate blowing my own trumpet, but I was looking through my press cuttings only yesterday. I've never seen such notices as I had for Polly Taggart. Von Rettemeyer closing his eyes. Favorable? favorable <laughs> they make me blush to read them stupid of me but they make me blush positively jimmy comes to lily bland following her on her way she sees the handkerchief and powder puff lying upon the floor why there it is picking up the handkerchief and puff and rubbing the puff which is an extremely ragged one over her nose singing sentimentally there are no friends like the old friends, the constant tried and true. Sitting beside Lily. Room for a little un? Lily, without interrupting her talk with Barncombe, lays her hand on Jimmy's for a moment. Bland to Jimmy. 
Bring you anything? Jimmy wrapping the puff in the handkerchief tenderly and slipping it into her bosom. A liqueur of petrol and a lucifer match. Bland leaving her. Oh, go on. Mrs. Stidolf to von Rettemeyer. And then to give it all up as I was idiot enough to do when I married. <sighs> and for a life as dull as ditchwater, if ever a woman sacrificed herself in this world. Fulkerson and Daphne enter at the door on the left and hurry to the counter. Fulkerson boisterously. Time! Time! To those standing at the counter. Hello, me! Hello, me! To Luigi. Glass of lemonade and the whiskey and soda. Quick with the whiskey and soda. Mrs. Stidolf to von Rettenmeyer. But I don't intend to stick to that arrangement. If I can't get back into the theaters, there are halls. I was telling the colonel this morning. Roper appearing before Mrs. Stidolf, his program in his hand. Ours, Dolly. Von Rettenmeyer, rising with alacrity. Ah! Bowing to Mrs. Stidolf. I yield with reluctance. Roper sits beside Mrs. Stidolf, and von Rettemeyer hastens to Eden. Roper to Mrs. Stidolf. Another waltz. Daphne to Hennage, who is claiming her. Wait till I've finished my drinks, Dewey. Land to Nita. Nita? No, this is with Douglas. Nothing of the sort. Nita referring to her program. You're correct. My mistake. De Castro coming to Gabrielle, who is talking to Sybil. Gapth. Oh, you again. De Castro mortified. Afraid, though. The sound of distant music is again heard, and there is a great deal of bustle as the men claim their partners. Tavish goes to Evangeline, Grimwood to Flo, Falk and Glenn to Olga and Sybil, and gradually the assemblage melts away. Fulkerson coming to Jimmy, who is carrying her program and standing before her, reading from his program. Vols, cry, decur. Jimmy, with withering accuracy. Vals, cri de coeur. Fulkerson, wagging his head. Very likely. Come along, Jimmy. Jimmy, rising and shaking herself out. Jane, to you, if you please. Tosh. I was christened Jane, Herbert. Well, I wasn't at a christening, see? No, but if you are not more careful of those feet of yours while you're waltzing, you will be at my funeral. She takes his arm and they go out at the door on the left. Smythe, Stidolf, Cooling, and Shirley follow talking together. All the couples have now disappeared except von Rettemeyer and Enid and Farncombe and Lily. Von Rettemeyer and Enid are at the counter, where Luigi is giving von Rettemeyer a glass of champagne, and the waiters are busying themselves in collecting the soiled glasses, plates, etc., which have been left upon the mantelpiece and chairs. The bearded waiter comes to Lily, and she hands him her plate. Farncombe to Lily. Shall we go down? She rises, leaving her bouquet upon the settee, and is about to put her arm through Farncombe's, when she checks herself, and looks at her program. Lily frowning. Psst. Eh? One, two, three, four. Why, this is our fifth dance. Yes. Five out of eight. Farncombe looking at his program. And ten, twelve, and fourteen are mine, too. Lily, with a movement of her shoulders, accepting his arm. How unfair. Farncombe, as they go to the right-hand door at the back. Unfair? To the others. I can't think what made me so thoughtless. They disappear. Two of the waiters carrying out the soil glasses, etc. Another follows with the ices. And the bearded waiter with the strawberries and cream. After a while, Luigi also withdraws. Enid, leaving the counter with von Rettemeyer. Well, what did you say to him? I told him the bees wants lifting in the second act, and that he ought to give you another dance. What did he say? He will think it over. Ha! Oh, 
That's my invariable formula, cunning old fox. But we are to talk about it later. I'm waiting to get him alone. <laughs> you won't get him alone, you stupid. He'll take precious good care of that. Finding that Luigi and the waiters have departed, and walking across to the left. Ah, oh, but it isn't dancing my mind's dwelling on just now, dear boy. Von Rettemeyer following her. Not. It's rest I'm yearning for. My holiday. Rest for my weary bones. Turning to him without a sign of disturbance. Carl, I'm simply bursting with rage. Rage? That wretched hotel at Ostend, the Plage. They have the confounded impudence to ask me a hundred and twenty-five francs a day for two cubbyholes on the third floor for my aunt and me. Monstrous. With a shrug. But Ostend is... Ostend. Thanks for the information. Is that all the sympathy you can offer? Pardon. There may be keeper orders. Where the common people pay for their beds and meals with cook's coupons. Sitting upon the arm of the further settee in the centre and swinging her feet. Oh, it doesn't matter. I suppose it'll have to be a swanage or some brisk resort of that description. Oh, so be it. Tra la 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 la. Von Rettemeyer sitting on the nearer settee in the centre, close to her, with an anxious expression. A hundred and twenty-five francs a day? Including nothing. Absolutely nothing. Von Rettemeyer biting his nails. Precisely. There's the eating and drinking. One can't starve, that's certain. Which would amount to... Enid watching him out of the corner of her eye. I believe Aunt and I could manage to feed ourselves on forty francs a day, or fifty, at a pinch. Von Rettemeyer, his face growing longer and longer. A hundred and twenty-five and fifty. A hundred and seventy-five. Stroking his hair with a finger. Call it two hundred. Von Rettemeyer, leaning back, appalled. Fifty zigs bounds a week? Sixty, in round figures. For a fortnight? Oh, no, dear. A fortnight's no use. But one becomes sick of a place after a fortnight. If you only go for enjoyment, not if you go for rest. Rest. Three weeks, then. A month. Smythe gives me the whole of August. Von Rettemeyer passing his hand across his forehead. A month. Enid rising and carefully picking a piece of fluff from her skirt. We're losing this dance. Shall we have a turn? He gets to his feet with some difficulty and then faces her. Von Rettenmeyer breathing heavily. Enid. Enid guilelessly. Yes. Von Rettenmeyer putting his heels together and bowing to her. If you would permit me to be your banker during your stay at Austin, four weeks. Carl. I should be most gratified. Enid going to him. I couldn't. Such an obligation. Von Rettemeyer bowing again. On my side. Enid giving him her hands. Of course, I defray my travelling expenses and tips and incidentals. Von Rettemeyer raising her hands to his lips. Ah. Not a penny of those should fall on you. Withdrawing her hands quickly and backing away from him. Hish! Stidolf enters at the door on the left, and again wanders to the counter. Stidolf taking another cigarette. You're missing a very pretty waltz, Miss Moncrief. Enid going to the door on the left, von Rettemeyer following her. I was just saying so to the Baron. Enid and von Rettemeyer disappear. Stidolf lights his cigarette, and is leaving the counter when Gabrielle and de Castro Enter at the right hand door at the back. De Castro looking exceedingly sulky. Stidolf to Gabrielle and De Castro. Ah, oh, Miss Cato. Ah, oh, Sam. A pleasant party, eh? Yes. Stidolf goes out at the right hand door at the back. De Castro crosses to the left and then turns to Gabrielle. Damn pleasant party. Well, don't make a scene. Scene? I'm not making a scene. Walking away from me in the middle of a dance and leaving me standing 
staring after you like a dirt-thirted child. You're making the scene. I am very sorry. I'm just as good a waltzer as anyone here, and better than most. Waving his arms. If you're tired of me, announce the fact quietly. Don't go and wipe your boots on me in public, because that hurts my pride. Gabrielle with a little twist of her body. I can't do more than apologize. First time I've ever done that to a man. The Castro coming to her mollified. I don't ask it, Gabs. I don't ask it. All I ask. Gabrielle sitting on the nearest settee in the center. If I'm rude, it's owing to my low spirits. I'm so shockingly low-spirited. I know you are, and I make allowances for your... I repeat, all I ask. Gabrielle, gazing at vacancy. Mine is a strange nature. On the stage, I'm liveliness itself. A perfect little lump of talent. I've been telling Carlton so, persuading him to introduce an extra song for you in Act Two. Gabrielle looking at De Castro. You have? Yes. Did he promise to think it over? His exact words. <laughs> Resuming her former attitude. As I was remarking, I'm a mass of inconsistency. On the stage, the embodiment of elfish fun. That was in the mail. Gabrielle nodding. In the mail. Off the stage, I am a sufferer from what's called the artistic temperature. No, temperament. The Castro uncomfortably patting her shoulder. Oh, poor little girl, poor little girl. Gabrielle, her melancholy increasing. Sometimes I've an idea that if I had a motor car of my own, I should feel easier and happier. What do you mean, a motor car of your own? Mine's always at your disposal, isn't it? Gabrielle shaking her head. That's not the same thing. Whenever I have yours out, I am weighed down by a sense of borrowing. Well, if I gave you a new car, you'd be weighed down by a sense of my having paid for it. At first I should, but not for long. Seeing my family crest on the door panels instead of your monogram would help me to forget you'd had anything to do with it gloomily of course it would be only an experiment it might cheer me up or it mightn't the music ceases a waiter carrying a tray enters at the door on the left goes behind the counter and mixes some drinks the castro after a pause loosening his collar in a low voice here we'd better discuss this experiment glancing over his shoulder at the waiter let's come and sit in the pit gabrielle rising i can't argue my head is too bad for that de castro leading her to the double door i don't want to argue i simply want to arrive at an understanding supposing i buy you a car am i to be made an ass of at the next dance we happen to meet at Yes or no. They go out onto the landing and disappear as Fulkerson hurries in at the right-hand door at the back. His eyes are rather glassy and his utterance is a little thick. Fulkerson to the waiter, joining him behind the counter. Hi, wake up there. Guess it's a word of Miss Pearson's stage. Miss Pearson's stage glass of soda with her. I'd have a whiskey. What's a whiskey? Wh which is the whiskey thing? Pouring some whiskey into a tumbler. You took soda water with Miss Birch. I mix my own whiskey. Loose chops of soda water, Miss Birch. The waiter goes out with the drinks, and Fulkerson, glass in hand, comes to the nearer side of the counter. 
he swallows his drink greedily singing to himself between the gulps oh the girls oh the girls i will fully full of the girls putting his empty glass upon the counter and making for the door on the left be they by the blood of the gas i'm found and dreadfully fond of the gas he vanishes as farncombe and lily enter at the right-hand door at the back there is an air of constraint and uneasiness about the girl she comes to the nearer settee in the centre and again picks up her bouquet farncombe follows her they talk in subdued voices and with frequent pauses another ice lily rearranging a rose no thanks i i wish i had given you a bouquet instead of a big ugly basket why you you might have brought it to the theatre as you have that one and carried it about with you i didn't bring this to the theatre no i found it with a lot of other flowers at the stage door it's from the gallery boys looking at him for a moment steadily and i attach some value to it the bearded waiter enters at the right-hand door at the back takes a box of cigars from the counter and goes out at the door on the left lily walks away from farncombe and seats herself upon the further settee in the centre farncombe as the waiter has withdrawn producing his program number nine two-step mind the paint to lily of course you you are engaged for this and you surely no i i kept it open in case in case i dance it with maury mr cooling maury cooling farncombe after another pause sitting behind her upon the nearer settee miss parida well i wonder whether mr cooling would let you off i shouldn't dream of asking him no but may i i beg you'll do nothing of the sort forgive me there is a further pause and then she turns to him why i spoke so so sharply to you was <laughs> you didn't speak sharply to me was because i've been very nasty with maury wrote him a furious letter and i want to make it up to him ah uh, yes i called him a pig and other things i hate myself for it a pig lily smiling still that's no reason why i should be nasty with you and call me a pig lily impulsively kneeling upon the settee so that she may compare her program with his look here fifteen the last but one are you fixed up for fifteen no no i kept it open in case ha <laughs> a checking herself severely i might be able to give you fifteen farncombe scribbles on his programme eagerly don't count on it please but it's booked to mr fulkerson and bertie's not always to be depended upon at that hour thank you thank you thank you she resumes her seat and he jumps up and goes to her that reminds me may i ask who is going to see you home miss paradell see me home it would be an honour that i should appreciate more than i can find words to express lily rising sternly i am very much obliged to you walking away from him again i dare say mr roper will see me home and mr de castro and mr bland Barncombe following her unhappily. I, I... I hope... I... I hope I haven't offended you. Not in the least. Only I am in the habit of relying on old friends for those little services. Stidolf enters from the landing and again wanders to the counter and to the cigarettes. The bind the paint air to the time of a two-step is played in the distance farncombe bowing to lily slightly and drawing himself up shall i take you to mr cooling lily with dignity inclining her head will you she is putting her hand through his arm 
when the look upon his face softens her she drops her voice to a whisper have i hurt you oh uh, i deserve the rebuke no you don't gently you may leave me at my door with the others if it will give you any satisfaction as they walk to the door on the left they are met by cooling cooling to lily breathlessly how here you are lily leaving farncombe her manner altering completely come on maury her feet moving to the music tra la la tra la la giving her bouquet to farncombe hi bring my flowers tra la tra la, -la, tra -la, -la. Tra -la, -la. They run out, half dancing. Stidolf calling to Farncombe, who is following them. Lord Farncombe? Yes. Stidolf going to him. Will you spare me a moment? Farncombe, a little impatiently. Uh, certainly. Stidolf laying a shaking hand on Farncombe's arm and leading him away from the door. Excuse me for what I'm going to say to you. I, I know your father, knew him very well years ago, and your mother. With deep feeling. My boy, my dear boy. Farncombe surprised. Colonel? I, I, I'm sorry to find you in this set. What do you mean? Don't be angry with me. I'm an old man and an old fool but it's from the fools that the useful lessons are to be learnt farncombe withdrawing his arm from stidolf i really don't understand you try to not now at another time when this music isn't exciting you nor these pretty women think it out by yourself you're at the beginning of your career, my boy. Remember me, the, the, the old fool who brought his to a miserable end, and that I cautioned you, cautioned you. Luigi hurries in at the door on the left, followed by a waiter carrying a tray, and by the waiter with the beard. <laughs> Behind the counter preparing drinks. Look out, gentlemen. You are losing it all. They are having a romp, a fine luck. Farncombe goes out at the door on the left. Make haste, Colonel. Make haste. Stidolf goes out slowly at the right-hand door at the back. Whisk and soda for Mr. Tavish. Liqueur of brandy, Mr. Greenwood. The waiter carrying the tray goes out with the drinks at the door on the left. Ha ha ha! Tra la la! Tra la la! Luigi is following the waiter who has carried out the tray when the bearded waiter, coming to the nearer settee in the center, sitting upon the settee, calls to him gruffly. Luigi? Luigi halting. Eh? The bearded waiter taking out a handful of money and selecting some gold from it here putting the gold into luigi's palm for your chaps oh you are spoiling them the bearded waiter giving some more gold pieces to luigi for you luigi bowing low thank you very much with a polite grin as he disposes of the coins in different pockets hope you have enjoyed yourself captain the bearded waiter speaking in the voice of g's thoroughly quietly between his teeth warm work though rising slowly like a man with stiff joints i'll be off now with your permission see you at lunch captain probably nodding good night good morning he slouches away to the door on the left and there stops listening there is the sound of people approaching singing uproariously and shouting and laughing hello luigi at his elbow ho 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 luigi goes out into the corridor and g's retreats behind the counter 
the noise increases and presently fulkerson rushes in flourishing his arms madly he is followed by glenn and shirley who are carrying lily upon their interlocked hands and by pock who is helping to support her then come hennage and nita grimwood and daphne tavish and flo von rettemeyer and enid de castro and gabrielle roper and mrs stiddle farncombe and jimmy bland and evangeline cooling and sybil and smythe and olga singing the chorus of the mind the paint song and dancing to it wildly they circle the saloon twice go out at the right-hand door at the back return at the door on the left and finally disappear through the double door and along the landing the waiters who have brought up the rear of the procession gather with luigi in the left-hand corner clapping their hands and stidolf returns entering at the right-hand door at the back lily waving her bouquet and shrieking with laughter <laughs> don't drop me <laughs> don't drop me hennage and grimwood yelling whoop 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 fulkerson deliriously endeavoring to stand upon his head whoop. jimmy breaking from the rank and jumping on to the further settee mind the pained mind the pained a girl is not a sinner just because she's not a saint <laughs> you drop me <laughs> as the procession passes out of sight followed by luigi and the waiters jeez departs at the door on the left and stidolf once more goes to the counter and lights a cigarette end of act two Act Three of the Mind the Paint Girl by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The scene is Lily's boudoir, a room upon the second floor of her house adjoining her bedroom. The decorations, though delicate, are gay with a good deal of pink in them. In the wall facing the spectator are two doors one on the left, the other in the center. The left-hand door opens into the room from the landing, where the staircase is shown. The center door admits to the bedroom. In the right-hand wall there are two sash windows, giving a view of the tops of trees growing in a square. In the opposite wall, the grate hidden by a low painted screen is the fireplace. A prettily designed fitment runs along the left-hand wall and the further wall taking in the fireplace and doors as part of its scheme. On either side of the fireplace there is a cupboard with drawers beneath it. Between the door on the left and the door in the center is a similar cupboard, and on the right of the center door, extending to the right-hand wall, there is a wardrobe with sliding doors. The cupboard doors are glazed and curtained in pink silk. In the middle of the room, a little to the right, there is a large and comfortable settee, and on the left of the settee is a table littered with books, magazines, a scent atomizer, a small silver-framed mirror, a case of manicure instruments, a box of cigarettes, and a match-stand, and other odds and ends. Behind the table there is a full tool stool, and on the right of the table a cozy armchair. A second armchair stands apart between the table in the center and the fireplace. On the extreme left of the room, on the nearer side of the fireplace, there is a box ottoman. On the other side of the room, by the nearer window, are a small writing table and chair. Standing across the right-hand corner, the keyboard, towards the further window, are a cottage piano and a music stool. And at the back of the piano, there is another small chair with some soiled gloves upon it. A quantity of music is heaped untidily on the top of the piano. One of the wardrobe doors is open, revealing some dresses hanging within and the edge of a lace petticoat with its insertion of colored ribbon peeps out from under the carelessly closed lid of the box ottoman two milliner's hat boxes are on the floor by the ottoman and a pair of satin slippers are lying one here one there under the center table the window blinds are down but the daylight is seen through them the door on the left opens and lily carrying her bouquet enters and makes straight for the windows and draws up the blinds, letting in the clear morning light. She is followed by Enid, Gabrielle, Daphne, and Jimmy, 
and they by Farncombe, von Rittemeyer, de Castro, Roper, Fulkerson, and Bland. They are all pale and haggard, and slightly disheveled, but everybody seems broad awake, except Daphne, who is borne down by sleepiness. Some of the men are smoking. Lily laying her bouquet upon the table in the center as she crosses to the windows to the women. Come in, dears. Drawing up the blind of the nearer window. Come in, boys. Take off your things for a minute. Fulkerson, whose inebriety has reached the argumentative stage. Worky clashes. Don't talk to me about worky clashes. Hush. Shut up, Bertie. I'm a shake of a very man shut of the name working clashes. Sit on his head, somebody. We shall wake Ma and the servants. Lily taking off her wrap and hanging it up in the wardrobe. Don't worry. You won't wake my servants. And Mother's bound to hear us. She sleeps so lightly when I'm out. Daphne, gaping violently. How? Oh. Jimmy clapping her hand over Daphne's mouth. Manners. Fulkerson depositing his overcoat and hat upon the fauteuil stool. One will imagine working Magellan impression with does this work. Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Some truth in what Bertie's saying, though. For instance. Fulkerson with great disgust. British working men. By Jove, yes. When I think of the work Mr. Lionel Hesketh Roper manages to dispose of in the course of a day. Von Rettemeyer and de Castro have placed their overcoats and hats upon the chair at the back of the piano, and Farncombe, Bland, and Roper have piled theirs on the armchair on the left. Enid and Gabrielle throw their wraps upon the settee. Daphne drops hers upon the box ottoman and Jimmy puts hers over the arm of the chair by the center table. Lily to everybody. I'll just run upstairs and tell Mother that all serene. She goes to the door on the left. Farncombe, Bland, and Roper get in each other's way in their desire to open it for her. If any of you want a drink, you must hunt for it yourselves in the dining room. To Roper. You play host, Uncle Lal. She disappears, turning to the left and ascending the stairs. Now then, give your orders, gents. Coming forward. Ladies, don't all speak at once. Fulkerson, making for the door. I'll have some whiskey and soda. He goes along the landing and down the stairs, Bland following him. No, no, Bertie, Bertie. Jimmy, seated in the armchair by the center table, to Roper. Stop it. We'll have trouble enough to get that boy home as it is. Roper hurries out after Bland and Fulkerson. Von Rettemeyer and de Castro also move to the door. Von Rettemeyer to Enid, who is sitting with Gabrielle on the settee. Enid? A glass of soda water. Same for me, Von. Jimmy? No, thanks. Von Rettemeyer looking down upon Daphne, who has curled herself up on the box ottoman and is already asleep, sentimentally. Baby, baby. Ah. Don't disturb her. Let her have her snooze in peace. Von Rettemeyer, still contemplating Daphne. Shall I bring you your bottle, you pretty little baby? Don't be an idiot, Carl. Sam, will you fetch me some soda water? I beg pardon. He goes out with the castro. Enid has taken the mirror from the table and now looks at herself in it. What a sight! To Gabrielle. I wonder whether Lil would mind me going into her bedroom. Gabrielle taking the mirror from Enid. Of course she wouldn't. Viewing herself with dismay. Oh, I'm yellower than you. She jumps up, throwing the mirror upon the settee and goes to the door in the center. Enid follows her, and the two girls open the door narrowly and withdraw. Jimmy rises and picks up the mirror. Jimmy, with one knee upon the settee, surveying herself. Oh, you lovely creature. 
glancing at farncombe as she readjusts the comb and finding that he is gazing at her earnestly turn your face to the wall please i'm about to use my puff suddenly with rapid movements he shuts the door on the left gives a quick look at daphne assures himself that the center door is closed and comes to jimmy she stares at him in astonishment farncombe standing at the back of the settee in a low voice miss birch your miss paradell's friend her great friend will you be a friend of mine too and do me a service jimmy startled it it all depends beggar to allow me to remain behind with you for a few minutes after the others have gone remain you and i and then if she will will you wait in the next room while i speak to her miss birch i i must speak to her w wouldn't to tomorrow it is tomorrow now it's day jimmy dropping her eyes she's tired five minutes no longer won't you try to arrange it for me jimmy pursing her lips hmm i'd stay delighted it doesn't matter how tired i feel i'm a brute but i really think the arranging is your job lord farncombe i know i should make a bungle of it with all these people round me and attract attention you're clever jimmy raising her eyes to his abruptly look here do i guess correctly what she pulls him towards her and whispers into his ear he nods she whispers again breathlessly and then releases him eh eh farncombe drawing back and facing her firmly yes jimmy walking away in a flutter oh oh, oh. you'll help me she pauses deliberating you'll help me jimmy returning to him with an air of prudence i tell you what i will do pointing to the writing table scribble her a note a line and i'll give it to her that won't attract attention i've no objection to do that for you hurry up he sits at the writing table and searches for writing materials in the drawer he opens a drawer and takes out a sheet of note paper standing at the other side of the table she selects a pen and hands it to him a j suit you farncombe taking the pen from her what shall i say <laughs> well i never he writes oh but it isn't exactly a love letter is it simply say what was the expression you used just now will you allow me to remain behind for a few minutes with miss birch after the others have gone farncombe writing thank you jimmy with a little wriggle call me jimmy if you like uh, thank you jimmy knitting her brow thoughtfully i suppose you ought to give her an inkling though the merest hint of the reason oughtn't you farncombe looking up ought i well you don't want her to think it's only to chat about the weather for heaven's sake don't chaff me writing after the others have gone writing his pen how would this do i know i am presuming a lot but i i can't leave you i can't leave you till i till i have asked you till i have asked you the most important question a man can put to a woman oh but that's ideal gabrielle reappears dash these girls to gabrielle whose complexion is much improved lord farncombe is writing me out a remedy for freckles isn't it sweet of him gabrielle mournfully freckles if you want to see a martyr to freckles come to my door enid returns with lips that are a little too red as von rettemeyer and de castro re-enter at the door on the left they leave the door open von rettemeyer is carrying a siphon of soda water and de castro two tumblers the men put the siphon and tumblers on the center table 
and von rettemeyer fills the glasses and he and de castro hand them to enid and gabrielle i hope we have not kept you waiting bertie's been making himself a regular nuisance down stairs poor bertie pity he has this little failing yes there is not a nicer boy in london than bertie bar that flyth to his head though the four continue talking jimmy has gone back to farncombe who is still writing and is watching him impatiently jimmy to farncombe under her breath to be quick hastily he blots his note and folds it bland fulkerson and Ropin appear on the landing issuing from the staircase and they are joined by Lily, who comes down the stairs. Fulkerson on the landing to Lily, indignantly. Lily, Miss Bertel. Jimmy to Farncombe. Here she is. Roper to Fulkerson. Now then, have it out with Lily. What's wrong? Farncombe rises and slips his note into Jimmy's hand. Most justifiable treatment on the part of this gentleman von rettemeyer listening with the others at the centre table to what is going on upon the landing <laughs> jimmy to farncombe over her shoulder good luck bland to lily the youth is irate with us for cutting off supplies lily enters with fulkerson roper and bland following bland strolls over to the piano laughing my goodness is this where the gentleman shivated the lady of the house but take if refreshment be quiet bertie or i'll box your ears joining the group at the centre table oh i've had such a wigging for asking you up mother says we girls will look as ugly as sin on the stage to-night so we shall hags lily sitting in the armchair by the centre table i feel as fresh as paint to gabrielle give me a sip de castro hands gabrielle's glass to lily fulkerson gazing at daphne stupidly and singing to himself of the girls of the girls i will flee for of the girls be, be thy ever the blonde the gals i am blonde hush hush ma's quite right seating himself at the piano one more turn and then let's clear out lily jumping up hurrah to roper as bland runs his hands over the keyboard shut the door uncle lel ah one more turn in it a dreadfully fond of the girls roper closing the door choose your partners gents very softly bland plays the melody of a languorous song, and instantly von Rettemeyer and Enid and de Castro and Gabrielle dance to it. Von Rettemeyer and Enid at the back, de Castro and Gabrielle near the piano. Jimmy! Jimmy passes Lily to go to Roper. As she does so, she presses Farncombe's note into Lily's palm. What that says the postman. Catching hold of Roper and swinging him round. La, ra, ra, la. Lily to Farncombe, who is standing by the writing table. Lord Farncombe? Farncombe goes to her, and they dance together. Fulkerson to Daphne, tapping her on the shoulder. Miss dear, may I have the good pleasure? Shaking her. Miss dear, Miss dear. Daphne starting up. Oh! Looking round wildly. Oh! Fulkerson dancing with her. Excuse the absence of gloves. Oh, oh, I, I thought I'd gone to bed. With their hands on each other's shoulders, the couple swaying from side to side, half sing, half murmur the refrain of the song. If you would only, only love me, if you would merely, merely say, wait but a little, little for me, I will be yours, be yours some day. The refrain is repeated, the dancers droning to it with a buzzing sound, and then Bland returns to the melody. Lily, as she dances, recollecting the note she is holding and opening it. What's this? Reading the note, her arm resting upon Farncombe's shoulder. 
dear miss paradell glancing at the signature farncombe from you yes lily reading will you allow me to she reached to the end silently and then she stops dancing and they stand for a moment looking confusedly at each other then with an expressionless face she slips the note into her dress and they dance again singing the refrain as before bland at the finish shutting down the lid of the piano and rising ladies and gentlemen the festivities connected with miss pardell's birthday are over leaving the piano our lives will now resume their normal serious course Ah. The ladies put on their wraps, the men their overcoats, and there is a great deal of stir and chatter. De Castro assists Gabrielle, von Rettemeyer Enid, Fulkerson Daphne, and Farncombe Jimmy. Lily joins in the talk and bustle with forced animation. Jimmy and Farncombe glance at her, and then inquiringly at one another. Roper putting on his overcoat with Bland's help. Well, nobody can say the affair hasn't been a brilliant success. That's one comfort. Wouldn't be true if they did. To De Castro, irritably. You've got it inside out. Lily to Enid and Gabrielle, kneeling upon the settee. Ah, yes. Haven't we had a splendid, splendid time? Splendid! A charming party. Absolutely a one. Venus sign in knock boyt the dying sclave dienst in bright lily running to roper and seizing his hands a vote of thanks to lull for his share in getting it up bland slapping roper on the back bravo lull bravo, bravo lull bravo, bravo. 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 lily walking about and to carlton bravo carlton Bravo, Bravo, Carlton! De Castro putting on his overcoat. Don't forget Maury Coolin. No, don't forget Maury. Dear old Maury. Bravo, Bravo Maury! Bravo, Maury! Bravo, Bravo, Maury! There haven't been a hitch from start to finish, in fact. Lily at the nearer side of the table again. Not a hitch. Fulkerson remembering his grievance. I beg your pardon. Dare it. In difficulties with his overcoat. Well, gentlemen, you waited by the lady of the house, the partook of some refreshments. <laughs> 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 Gabrielle coming to Lily and kissing her. So long, dear. Enid, Daphne, and Jimmy also come to Lily, who embraces them demonstratively, and the men follow. Lily to the girls. Ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta. I won't come down. No, no, we'll let ourselves out. Leaving Lily. Till tonight. Till tonight. Shaking hands with the men. Ta-ta. Ta 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 Von Rettemeyer kissing her hand slyly. Goddess. Lily to Bland in a whisper. Take care of Bertie. Everybody moves to the door except Lily, who remains standing in the middle of the room. Some are on the landing, some in the doorway, when she calls to Roper and Jimmy. Uncle Lel, Jimmy. I want to speak to you two for a second. Roper and Jimmy detach themselves from the rest and return. Oh, and Lord Farncombe? Farncombe also returns, and Lily, passing him, goes on to the landing and mixes with the others. Be off. Lord Farncombe and Lal will look after Jimmy. Vincent, you close the front door. No noise. Au revoir, mes enfants. She watches them descend the stairs, and her manner, softening, comes back into the room. Lord Farncombe wants to have a quiet talk with me, Uncle Lel, about... about something, and he's asked me to let him remain behind with Jimmy for a few minutes. 
to Jimmy. But there's no necessity for you to wait, dear. Don't consider me. But I do. Go upstairs and tell mother that Lord Farncombe's with me. Say I promise he shan't stay long. To Roper. You'll take Jimmy home, won't you, Lal? Roper, his eyes bolting. W with pleasure. <laughs> Lily to Jimmy. I shall see you again later in the day, perhaps? Rather. Throwing her arms round Lily's neck and pressing her cheek to Lily's. Rather. To Roper significantly. Sit in the hall till I'm ready. She runs out to the landing, pausing at the door to bestow a parting nod and a smile upon Farncombe, and ascends the stairs. Roper, in a state of great excitement and exhilaration, to Lily. Yes, yes, I won't keep you, and... Winking at her and jerking his head in Farncombe's direction. From your tete-a-tete. -tete. Patting her face gleefully. <laughs> taking her hand, his own quivering. Lil, Uncle Lal, you call me, but I've always felt more like a parent towards you. Acted as such, eh? Y yes Lil. And any happiness that befalls you, any happiness that befalls you, uh, I leave it there. God bless you, God bless you. Bustling over to Farncombe, who, his hat in his hand, his overcoat on his arm, is standing near the piano. And God bless you, my lad. I'm proud, proud to have the honour, and to have been the means of, the means of... Ringing Farncombe's hand. God bless you both. He goes to the door, and there finds Lily. I, 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 I'll drop in by and by, and, and, and inquire after you, my pet. All right, Lal. Roper patting her face again. <laughs> With a hop. Guru, stand away from the lift. No more passengers this journey. He waves to Farncombe gaily and departs, closing the door. There is a short silence, and then Farncombe places his hat and overcoat upon the chair by the piano and turns to Lily. It's awfully kind and gracious of you to have granted my request, and frivolly selfish of me to have made it. I deserve to be kicked. Lily slowly advancing to the table in the center, avoiding his gaze. Is, is Jimmy aware of precisely what's in your note? He, he yes. Drawing nearer to her. I hope you won't be angry with me for confiding in her. You see, I, I... Lily at the further side of the table, fingering one of the objects upon it. And she'll confide in Uncle Lal. Shrugging her shoulders. Eh, the dear old Lal appears to have summed up the situation pretty accurately as it is. With an artificial little laugh. <laughs> well, I'm afraid they'll be horribly disappointed, poor wretches. Farncombe blankly. Disappointed? Pointed. Lily raising her eyes to his and shaking her head at him. You, you silly boy. Farncombe coming to her quickly. Oh, please, please don't take that tone with me. I'm no boy, and I'm simply mad about you. If you don't marry me, I, I, I'm done for. Hush, nonsense, not you. It's true. Life would be over for me from that moment if you refused to marry me. Lily mockingly. Over? Oh, love is all on my side at present, naturally. But as God hears me, it'll be no fault of mine if you don't grow to love me in time. Listen. I'll worship you. Worship you. I do worship you. Hush. Lord Farncombe. Eddie, won't you? Certainly not. Do. Eddie. Eddie. Eddie, then. Uh. Sit down a minute. She goes to the settee and sits there, somewhat ruffled, and he moves to the armchair by the center table and also sits, his elbows on his knees, bending towards her. She pushes her hair back from her brow impatiently, as if vexed with herself. Lord Farncombe, Eddie, for how long have you known me? 
What does it matter? I... I admit... Reckoning our acquaintance from last week, from the afternoon Bertie brought you here, when we scarcely spoke to one another, you haven't known me for as many days as you can count on your fingers. I've watched you. Watched you in the theatre. On the stage? Oh, oh, you. But I mustn't call you silly boy again, must I? And what do you know of me, apart from the glimpse you've had of me off the stage, and my being a shining light at the Pandora? What do you know of my, what's the word, origin? Where and what I've sprung from? How I was reared? How much education I've received? How much I've contrived to pick up of the way to behave in perlite society? You can judge from poor mother, if from nothing else, that I come from humble beginnings. Yes, but how humble you couldn't dream. Making a grimace? Not after supper of raw carrots. Do you think I care how humble your beginnings were? What I do know, what I am sure about, is that you're good and beautiful and... and... and gifted and... and leaning his head on his hands. Oh, I can't describe you. You're, you're, to me, you're perfect. Lily, after a pause, looking at him with blinking eyelids. You, you dear. He raises his head. She changes her tone instantly. Merci. Yes, perfect pour le moment. You're my French taking a box of cigarettes from the table. Have a cigarette. Don't get up. She tosses him a cigarette, and he catches it. My name's printed on them. Lily. Lighting a cigarette. Isn't it chic? Farncombe producing his cigarette case and exchanging her cigarette for one of his own. I'll never smoke that. Lily pushing the match stand towards him. Stupid. Now... Attend to me. What do you say to a tiny provision shop in Kennington over the water? Was that... Lily nodding. Hmm. That was my start in the world. Father kept a small shop in Kennington, Gladwin Street, near the Oval. We sold groceries and butter and eggs and cheese and pickled pork and paraffin. I was born there, on the second floor and in Gladwin Street I lived till I was fourteen. Then father smashed through the stores cutting into our little trade. Well, hardly smashed, that's too imposing. The business just faded, and one morning we didn't bother to take the shutters down. Then, after a while, father got a starvation berth, eighteen shillings a week, at a wholesale bacon warehouse, price and mostly's, still over the water, and I earned an extra five at a place in the Westminster Bridge Road, for passing the gilt edges on to Passepartout's from 9 a.m. to 6 in the evening. Barncombe, his head bowed again. Great heavens! Not a syllable against the Passepartout's. They were the making of me. It was the Passepartout's that brought me and Tedder together. Who? Tedder. In the house where I worked, a man of the name of Tedder, Ambrose Tedder, taught dancing, stage dancing. Tedder's Academy of Saltatory Art. And every time I passed Tedder's door, and heard his violin or piano, and the sound of the pupil's feet, I... Breaking off and throwing herself back. Oh, Lord, if once I... Go on, go on. Well... Ultimately, Tedder took me and trained me, did it for Nix, for what he hoped to get out of me in the future. Ah, uh, and he hasn't lost over me. Poor old Ambrose. He collared a third of my salary for ever so long, and now that the old chap's rheumatic and worn out, I... Oh, it's not worth mentioning. Jumping up and walking away. My stars, he could teach good Tedder. I began by going to him for the last twenty minutes of my dinner hour. 
he wanted to stop that because it was bad for me he said to practice on a full <laughs> a full <laughs> on a full <laughs> behind the table resting her two hands upon it and shaking with laughter <laughs> if i ever had in those days <laughs> farncombe writhing ah oh, don't don't lily brushing the tears from her eyes oh. <laughs> i was a pupil of tedder's for twelve months and then he got me on at the canterbury and from the canterbury i went to gatti's and from Gatis to the lane, for a few lines in the pantomime and an understudy, my first appearance in the West End. Oh, the West End is the best end. And from there I went to the Old Strand, and there Maury Cooling spotted me, and that led to me being engaged at the Pandora, where I ate my heart out, doing next to nothing, for two whole years. Then came the production of the Duchess of Brixton, and it was in the Duchess, thanks to Vincent Bland, that I sang the Mind the Pain song. He believed in me, did Vincent. He saw I was fit for something more than just prancing about and airing my ankles in a gay frock. By Jupiter, how he fought for me! How he fought for me, up to the final rehearsal! And to this day, whenever I indulge in a prayer, you bet Vincent Bland has a paragraph all to himself in it. Checking herself and coming to Farncombe. Oh, but I needn't inflict quite so much of my biography on you, need I? He rises. Sorry, I merely wanted to tell you enough to show you... to show you... Farncombe close to her, gazing into her eyes. To show me what a... What a marvel you are. Lily, pleased. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, I'm not chucking mud at myself, really. Why should I? Many a woman would feel as vain as a peacock in my shoes. Fancy. From the shop in Gladwin Street to... With a gesture. To this. And from Tedder's stuffy room in the Westminster Bridge Road to the stage of the Pandora as principal girl wonderful lily carried away by her narration and putting her hands upon his shoulders familiarly yes and all the schooling i've ever had eddie was at a cheap frowsy day school in kennington with a tribe of other common skinny-legged brats imagine it barncombe taking her hands i can't imagine it I defy anybody to. Lily unthinkingly allowing him to retain her hands. Everything I've learned since, except my music, and that I owe to Tedder and Vincent. Everything I've learned since, I've learned by sheer cuteness, from novels, the papers, the theatres, and by keeping my ears open like a cunning little parrot. <laughs> That's what I am. A cunning little parrot. <laughs> Lily tossing her head. Oh, I dare say, if I had the opportunity, I could imitate the fine ladies you mix with, so that in less than six months you'd hardly know the difference between them and me. Barncombe holding her hands to his breast. There is no difference already. There is none. Isn't there? Almost nestling up to him. Ah, oh, you should see me in one of my vile tempers. Wistfully. Then, then you wouldn't. Becoming conscious of her proximity to him, she backs away and stands rubbing the palms of her hands together in embarrassment. Anyhow, anyhow, it isn't my intention to give you a chance of comparing us. Farncombe under his breath. <sighs> Miss Paradell. Lily, collecting herself. No, I... I'm not going to let you make a fool of yourself over me, if I can help it. Fool? Lily, facing him and speaking quietly, but firmly. Recollect 
however shrewd and apt i may be and however straight i've managed to keep myself still i'm only a pandora girl and should always be remembered as one by your chums and belongings only a pandora girl nothing can alter that dear boy and you mustn't you mustn't handicap yourself by hanging me round your neck i i shouldn't be the first of my sort to marry a pandora girl not by half a dozen or more no but without wishing to flatter you i don't quite put you on a level with robbie kinterton and glenroy and georgie Faucus and that crew cheerfully and so i mean to take care of you to take care of you for your own sake and for your mammies and daddies she turns from him and fetches his hat and coat and gives them to him he receives them from her with a dazed look time's up after a silence during which neither stirs never mind you'll survive it another pause come along she passes him to go to the door on the left as she does so he flings his hat and coat on to the settee and clasps her in his arms lily lily ah that's not fair don't don't send me away like this lily her hand against his breast it isn't fair of you say you'll take time to consider i hate you for it ask roper's advice your mother's i've trusted you ask miss birch eddie lord farncombe he releases her and they confront one another she panting he hanging his head guiltily well i i have been mistaken in you farncombe in despair i i turning from her and hitting his temples with his fists forgive me forgive me ha i i thought you were such a quiet bashful fellow forgive me f forgive me she wavers and then slowly approaches him lily gently don't don't fret about it i forgive you touching his arms with her fingertips i'm to blame drawing a deep breath all those dances he seizes her hand and kisses it passionately i may see you again i may see you again lily 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 in a whisper averting her head no we, we'd better not there is a low but distinct knocking at the door on the left she withdraws her hand and they look at each other he inquiringly she with a calm face the knocking is repeated mother she goes to the door and speaks with her mouth close to it that you mother she listens for a reply and again the knocking is heard who is it she opens the door jees is outside nico jees comes into the room he has rid himself of his wig and beard and is wearing an overcoat buttoned up to his chin and a cap drawn down to his brows his face is white and his jaws are set determinedly how how have you got in he produces a bunch of keys and grimly displays a latch-key oh oh pulling off his cap jees advances to the table in the centre glaring at farncombe Lily closes the door sharply and also advances, speaking volubly to Varncombe as she comes forward. Captain Jays is in the habit of bringing me home from the theatre after my work, and a long while ago I gave him a latch-key to carry on his key-ring, so that he could let me into my house whenever I'd forgotten my own key. He hasn't the slightest right to use it at any other time. Nobody knows that better than he does it's a confounded liberty to jees hotly what are you doing here at all at this hour of the morning jees after an expressive glance at farncombe an odd question in the circumstances answer me keeping an eye on you 
spying on me. On you. Jerking his head towards Farncombe. And? How dare you? I've been at it all night. All night? Yes, I was in the theater while you were supping and dancing. You were? I meant to be there. You did your best to stop it. That's a lie. So that you could enjoy yourself thoroughly. Glancing at Farmcombe again. With? A lie. I didn't leave till past three. You and? With another motion of his head towards Farncombe. Had just had your fifth dance together, and they were hauling you round the building. Where were you? Who? Excuse me, that's my business. Then I went back to German Street, and it suddenly struck me I'd like to see how your escort was composed. You've been watching outside? Since a quarter to four, under the portico at the corner. Lily, contemptuously. You? Yes, but by God, I wasn't quite prepared for this. This? G's cramming his cap into his overcoat pocket and coming to Farncombe. What the hell's your game? You've got some accommodating friends, both of you, and that blackguard Roper and that slut Jimmy Birch. Oh. Approaching G's with clenched fists. Ah, uh, you cur. Farncombe holding up his hand to her appealingly. Miss Paradell. Lily to G's. You cur. Mother's been told that Lord Farncombe's with me. I sent Jimmy up to tell her. Where is your mother? In bed, of course. Snoring. Ha, ha, ha. Fa, there's an ugly name, my girl, for such mothers as yours. Oh. Raising her fist. Oh. Miss Paradell. Lily restraining herself with difficulty and pacing the room. Oh, the cur. The cur, the cur. Farncombe to G's, looking at him steadily. Captain J's. The low cur. Captain J's, do you happen to know where I lodge? No, I don't know where your sty is. St. James Place, 47. I shall be in at twelve o'clock. Picking up his hat and overcoat. From the tone this gentleman adopts, Miss Paradell... I assume that he considers himself entitled to concern himself in your affairs. Moving over to the left where Lily joins him. Perhaps it will make it easier for you if I... Lily clutching his arm. Oh, I'm so indignant, Eddie. I... 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 Eddie. Eddie. Lily turning upon G's in a fury. Yes, you can't. Eddie. Eddie. Eddie, you cad, you sneak, you idler, you waster. I've stood it long enough. This is the last straw. I've done with you. I'm sick to death of you. How I've tolerated you all these years is a mystery to me. After this, get out of my sight and never show yourself to me again. Jeez, grasping her wrist fiercely. Lily. Lily wrenching herself free. What? Losing control over herself utterly. You'll spy on me, will you, you shabby loafer? You'll peep at me while I'm eating my supper and count the dances I choose to give that boy over there, will you? And then you'll break into my house and insult my friends behind their backs and insinuate foul things against my poor old mother. You damned coward. And against me... Pointing to Farncombe. And him. Why, well, you're not fit to black his boots, and you never were. Never. You, you, you scum. Here. Taking Farncombe's note from her bosom and thrusting it at G's. Read that. Sitting in the armchair by the center table. Read it, read it, read it. G's reads to himself. Out loud. Jeez, mumbling. Dear Miss Paradell, will you allow me? Louder. 
Will you allow me to remain behind for a few minutes with Miss Jimmy after the others have gone? I know I am presuming a lot, but I cannot leave you till I have asked you the most important question a man can put to a woman. Farncombe. Lily Breathless. Written here, on my notepaper, while I was out of the room, it came on me like a thunderclap. Ah, ah. G sits upon the settee, staring at the carpet. And Maury Cooling and Lal will tell you that I hadn't a notion that Lord Farncombe was to be at the supper last night, or any of the boys. Not a notion. I blackguarded them both for deceiving me, and causing me to deceive you. Taking the scent atomizer from the table, and spraying her face with it. Now, what have you to say now? Ah! Ah! Geez, huskily. Why, why the devil did you let Jimmy go? Why did you let her go? It was knowing that you and Farcombe were alone that, that made me... Oh, if I'd suspected that a private detective was hovering around, I'd have kept the whole lot of my friends. As it was, Jimmy was looking dead, and... In disdain. Bah! There is a pause, and then G sits upright and draws his hand wearily across his eyes. G's to Lily. Well, I, I beg your pardon. Lily continues to spray herself energetically. I'm not so completely scum as not to see that I ought to beg your pardon. Humbly. I beg your pardon. Lily softening by degrees. You, you drive me mad sometimes. Positively frantic. Geez, partly to himself. Mad. To Farncombe. And you, Farncombe. I hope you'll accept my apologies. I offer them unreservedly. Farncombe bows somewhat stiffly. Lily to G's, protruding her lower lip. I... I didn't mean half I said, Nico. I didn't mean half of it. I in Farncombe askance as she replaces the atomizer. And I... I'm ashamed of myself for losing my self-control as I did. There is another pause, and then G's gets to his feet and silently returns the note to Lily. She looks up at him piteously and puts the note back into her bosom. Then he takes out his key ring, removes the latch key from it, and throws the key on the table. Having done this, he drags his cap from his pocket and makes for the door on the left. As he passes Lily, she rises and gently plucks at his sleeve. Nico, Nico. Eh? Won't you, won't you give Lord Farncombe some explanation? Explanation? Of the sort of terms we've been on, you and I. He, he must be rather puzzled. Turning away to the table. Oh, it's due to you as well as to me. Just as you please. Ha <laughs> ha! Yes, perhaps it is due to me that he should learn a little more about me than he's been able to gather from personal observation, and from your eloquent but summary description. Under his breath, screwing up his cap. Idler, waster, loafer. Lily penitently. Nico. Geez to Farncombe quietly. Ah, oh, what's a true bill, Farncombe? And yet, a very few years back, she won't dispute it. I was one of the smartest chaps going, good at my job, with prospects as rosy as any man's in my regiment. There wasn't a cloud the size of your hand, apparently, in my particular bit of sky at the time I speak of, not a speck. Then I met this young lady, and... Pointing to the box, Ottoman. Well, since we're in for it... Oh, uh, Captain Jays. No, no. She wishes you to understand the exact nature of the friendship between her and me. I'm obeying instructions. Farncombe sits on the ottoman, nursing his hat and overcoat. Then G sits in the armchair by the center table, first turning the chair so that it faces Farncombe. Farncombe, 
I was under thirty, and still a subaltern when I made Miss Paradell's acquaintance. Like most of my pals, I was spending my nights, whenever I could get away from Aldershot, in the stalls at the Pandora, much the same as you've been doing recently, and as a certain class of young man will go on doing as long as the Pandora and similar shops continue to flourish. Ha! How honored we felt, we men in those days, at knowing some of the Pandora girls, and having the privilege of supping em and standing em dinner on Sunday evenings. If they'd been royal princesses, we couldn't have been more elated. With a gesture. Don't jump at conclusions. It generally ended there, or with our running into debt at a jeweler's. We were young, they were beautiful, or we thought em so, but the majority of us weren't vicious, any more than the majority of the girls were though many of them were mighty calculating. It would have been better for us men if all the girls had been wicked. The glamour, the infatuation, the folly would have been sooner over, and one of us at least would have had a different tale to tell. Jeeze pauses, gazing at the floor. Farnco moves impatiently on the ottoman, and Lily sits herself upon the settee. Lily, plaintively, Nico, Nico, I merely wanted you to... Jeez rousing himself and speaking to Lily over his shoulder. Who was it introduced us? Miss Duquesne, Aggie Duquesne. Agnes Duquesne, she's gone under. To Lily. Outside Buckley's Oyster Bar, wasn't it? Not outside, in the parlor. Jeez to Farncombe. Lily had only lately come to the Pandora, a pale-faced slip of a thing. Eighteen, weren't you? Lily nodding. Eighteen. I confess I wasn't overwhelmingly attracted by her at first. She was so unlike the rest. Laughing bitterly. Ha ha ha. Wasn't I dowdy? But she was humble and naive and confiding and my vanity was tickled by her delight at the little treats I gave her, and by her gratitude for a twopenny, halfpenny present or two. Nobody, I believe, with any pretensions to being a gentleman, had paid her much attention before I arrived on the scene. No, nobody. I didn't find out that I was in love with her. You guess it's a love story, don't you? Farncombe, delicately. My dear Captain Jace, I didn't find out that I was neck and heels in love with her until nearly a year afterwards, when my regiment went to the Kura. That did it. Separation. What I suffered in that hole, thinking of her, starving for her. In less than three months I was in London again, on leave and in my old stall at the Pandora. But even then, Farcombe, I hadn't your pluck. Pluck? The pluck to snap my fingers at the world and propose marriage to a Pandora girl. Besides, my mother was alive then, and... Abruptly, with a wild look. Would you like to know what she used to call these Pandora women, Farcombe? Bending forward, his hands tightly clenched. She used to call them a menace to society. With their beauty and their flagrant opportunities for displaying it, they are a living curse, she used to say. A source of constant dread to mothers whose hope it is to see their sons safely mated to modest, maidenly girls of the typical English pattern. She told us once, my brothers and me, frightened as to where we were drifting, that she was one of many mothers who prayed on their knees daily that their boys might be spared from being drawn into the net woven by their own weaknesses and passions, drawn into it by these, these... He breaks off, stares about him for a moment, and then rises. Oh, but I oughtn't to have repeated this to you. Pardon. Walking away unsteadily. Oh, damned bad taste. Behind the table, supporting himself by leaning upon it. Where was I? Back from the corral. Yes, yes. And so things went on for a couple of years. I trailing after Lily closer than ever. And at last, at last I did ask her to be my wife. Lily, who has been listening to G's with parted lips and wide-open eyes, appealingly. Don't. Don't, Nico, don't. 
G's oblivious of her interruption. But I'd left it too late. The novelty of me had worn off. She'd scores of friends by that time. She'd made her big hit and followed it with another, and was the talk of the town. And she'd money. She wasn't dependent on me any longer for her gloves and her trips and outings. Lily, her head drooping. Oh, oh. Wringing her hands. Oh, that's beastly of you. Beastly. She was kind to me, too. In a way, kind and cruel. She didn't want to marry me. She didn't want to marry anybody. She was in love with herself, and her success, and what it was bringing her. But she wouldn't give me the kick. No, she wouldn't do that. I had been something to her. And that's where the kindness came in, and the merciless cruelty. Sitting upon the fauteuil stool rigidly. God, if only she'd broken with me then, firmly and finally, if only she'd broken with me then, she, she might have saved me. Lily struggling with her tears. Oh, Nico, Nico. Twelve months ago she did throw me a bone. The regiment was under orders for India, and of course I sent in my papers, and out of pity, I suppose, and because I was always pestering her, she promised to become engaged to me if I'd get other work to do. Work? I wonder whether really she was grinning to herself when she made the stipulation. Oh. oh. Work. All the spunk, all the energy, had been sapped out of me long before, and even her promise couldn't revive it. My search for a birth wasn't much more than a sham. At the back of my head I knew very well what I'd come to. The only work I was capable of was dancing attendance on her, and filling in what remained of the day and night at a rotten restaurant, a bohemian club, and the bar of the theatre. And that's been my sole employment for the past year. Nothing but that. Pretty for a man who started life as swimmingly as I did. His voice dying away. Pretty, 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 pretty. Lily, after a profound stillness. I... I don't think you've ever... put the case to me quite so plainly as this, Nico. I... I don't think I've ever put it quite so plainly to myself. Lily, her lip trembling. You... you won't believe me. What? I... I... <laughs> I've never fully realized that till now, the harm I've done you. I declare to God I've never realized it till now. Nico. Geez, after a further pause. Ah, oh, well. With a deep sigh. Ah, oh, well. To Farncombe resignedly. Farncombe, I, I'm afraid I'm a shocking brute. I, I got carried away. Forget Forget the things I've said of this girl. Forget him, will yer? Starting to his feet. And look here, a man who isn't a sportsman deserves to be shot. You've won her, I've lost her. Congratulate yer, old chap, congratulate yer. Pulling on his cap. Take care of her, that's all. M -m Mind you take care of her. He turns towards the door, and she jumps up and runs to him and seizes his arm. Farncombe also rises. No, no, Nico, Nico. Giving Farncombe a half-frightened, half-imploring look. Nico, I can't undo the mischief I've done. I can't do that. But I can try to make it up to you, some of it. And I will, if you'll let me. Putting her arms round his shoulders. Nico. Jeez, roughly. Make it up to me. Lily, her face close to his. You know what I mean. As soon as possible. Next month, if you like. Next week. Quietly. He grips her arms and stares at her blankly. <laughs> yes, you've been in too great a hurry to settle matters. You have. Lord Farncombe and I, we... We're not going to be married. I've refused him. I... I've ruined you, Nico, but I, I've i told him I'm not going to draw him into my net. Clinging to G's and burying her face in the breast of his coat, crying, 
Oh, 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 I'm not going to draw him into my net. Again there is a pause, and then Jeeze turns to Farncombe, dazed. Farncombe? Farncombe inclining his head. Yes, yes. Jeeze, with feeling. My dear fellow, I, I... Lily raising her head and speaking through her tears to Jeez. Nico, I, I want to have one more word with Lord Farncombe. Just one more word. He nods understandingly and goes to the door on the left. She follows him. Only a minute. He opens the door. And then you must walk away together, you and he, and part good friends. He goes out on to the landing, and she closes the door and stands with her back to it, drying her eyes with her handkerchief. Farncombe, still carrying his hat and overcoat, has crossed to the settee, a forlorn figure. Well, you, you have had a lucky escape, haven't you? Escape. Lily leaving the door in advancing. You, you've heard what a cold-blooded, selfish wretch I am. How I've treated Nico. Farncombe waving the idea away. Ah. Uh. Lily coming to him. And you've seen what I'm like when I'm in a rage. You've seen what the genuine Lily Margaret Upjohn is, without her disguise. Looking up into his face pathetically. Yes, that was me, Eddie, under the crust. Common as dirt, dear. Common as dirt. Holding the lapels of his coat. Oh, oh, you'll always remember me, with my eyes starting out of my head, spitting at Nico. You'll always picture that horrible sight when you think of me. You were... you were provoked. I... I admired you for it. Lily tenderly. Oh, you dear boy. Eddie. Yes? Had you a little hope that, after all, I might turn your offer over in my mind and... and eventually... Yes, yes. Lily with a catch in her breath. <gasps> I... I'll tell you something. What? Lily in his ear. I might have, if... if you'd persisted. Farncombe groaning. Ugh. Lily retreating a step or two. Thank God Nico came along. Thank God Nico came along. What was it his mother called us girls? A menace to society. Creatures to be dreaded and prayed against. You see, I was right in wishing to protect you for your mammy's sake, as well as for your own. But, oh, thank God Nico came along. He sits suddenly upon the settee and covers his face with his hands. She returns to him quickly. Oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Touching his hands. Eddie, Eddie, I'm not worth it. Eddie. With an effort, he lifts his head. Listen, this is what I want to say to you. Don't come near me any more. You mustn't. And don't come to the theatre again, either. If I thought you were sitting in front, I... I'm sure I couldn't. Entreatingly. Swear. Swear you'll keep away from me, and from the theatre. He nods. And you'll never go to any supper or dinner or dance where you're likely to meet the other girls, will you? Eddie. He shakes his head. Swear. He rises, and as he does so, she grasps the lapels of his coat again, her eyes blazing fiercely. Oh, oh, if one of the girls ever got hold of you, I, I... <clears throat> hissing into his face. I'd kill her. She leaves him and goes to the door on the left and opens it. Nico. Jeez enters the room. March, both of you. I... I'm pretty well baked. Farncombe joins Lily and Jeeze at the door, and she stands between the two men, looking from one to the other and taking a hand of each. 
<laughs> I've made the pair of you precious miserable, if you only knew it. The jeez. The difference is that he'll soon forget me, and you, with me for a wife, are doomed for life. Putting her hands upon G's shoulders. Nico. She kisses him lightly, and having done so, asks him a question with her eyes. Jeez turns aside, and she faces Farncombe and offers him her lips. They kiss. Goodbye. After a moment's pause to both of them. Away with you. The two men go out, and she follows them to the top of the stairs and watches them descend. Then she slowly comes back into the room and stands listening at the door. There is a distant sound. Ah. <sighs> Partly closing the door, she wanders about the room aimlessly for a while. Then, impulsively, she runs to the further window, lifts the sash, and looks below. Oh! Oh! Drawing back. Oh! She shuts the window and comes to the settee, and sitting there takes off her shoes. Then she goes down upon the floor inelegantly, hunts for her slippers, and puts them on. As she rises, the door on the left is pushed open, and Mrs. Upjohn peeps in cautiously. Mrs. Upjohn, in a dressing gown, with her hair, now very scanty, tightly screwed up. Lil? Lily stiffening herself and speaking in a cold, level voice. Oh, I was just coming up to you, Mother, to get you to undo me. Mrs. Upjohn bustling to Lily. I didn't mean to, but I fell off. Unhooking Lily's dress. It was the front door I heard a minute ago then. It gave me such a start. In difficulties with the hooks. Turn more to the light, dearie. These dressmakers do it a purpose, I believe. The hooks on that new gown of mine are a perfect mystery. What's this? Lily twisting her body. Oh, don't fiddle so, mother. You did let him stay a time, Lil. Heaps to talk over, eh? Lily stonily. Heaps. Trying to assist Mrs. Upjohn. Oh. Well, dear, well, well, tell me what's took place. Don't keep me in suspense. I shan't tell you anything, mother, till I've had a sleep. I must go through the sheets first. Stamping her foot. Oh, tear the thing, tear it. Have you consented to make him happy, poor young gentleman? That's all I want to know, Lil. Overcoming a hook. There. Thank you, mother. Slipping her arms out of her dress. I can manage the rest. But, Lil, Terry. Oh, for mercy's sake. Leave me alone. Why can't you leave me alone? Oh, very good. Moving away indignantly as Lily with shaking fingers unfastens a necklace. This is my reward for lying awake half the night, is it? And for thinking of you and wondering about you. Ungrateful little puss, you. Going towards the door. After this... You can keep your affairs to yourself for as long as ever you choose. Don't you expect me. Lily suddenly sitting upon the settee. Mother? Yes? Lily, her hand to her brow. Oh, Mother. Mrs. Upjohn hurrying to Lily. What is it? Lily swaying. At last, at last. At last? Lily clinging to Mrs. Upjohn. I'm in love, mother. I'm in love, in love, in love. End of Act Three. Act Four of The Mind the Paint Girl by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The scene is the same as in the preceding act, but the light outside is brighter and warmer 
and in the room is more diffused on the table in the center placed close to the settee there is a small tray with a breakfast of tea and toast upon it the bedroom door is partly open lily wan and red-eyed is lying propped up by cushions upon the settee a newspaper is on her lap but she is gazing at vacancy she is in negligee a dainty morning robe covers her nightgown her bare feet are in slippers and her hair is in a simple knot maud is at one of the drawers of the cupboard at the back engaged in selecting some articles of lingerie and mrs upjohn completely dressed for the day is sitting in the armchair by the centre table her face hidden by a newspaper which she is reading presently maud shuts the drawer and carrying the lingerie comes forward maud to lily what frock will you put on lily starting slightly eh one of your embroidered muslins or your ninon lily languidly either i don't care oh, gracious what on earth is the matter with you this morning i've never known you as queer as this after any hop you've been to in my time to mrs upjohn who has lowered her paper nothing wrong is there lily turning over and burying her head in the cushions maud maud moving to the settee and bending over lily here i am lovey go into the next room and shut the door and don't let me see your stupid fat face till i come to you <laughs> that's better go into the bedroom door that's how i like to hear her talk we needn't send for dr gilson yet a while <laughs> she disappears into the bedroom and closes the door mrs upjohn looking at lily well yes mother have another cup of tea won't you no another bit of toast then no smoke a cigarette no you always do have a whip after your breakfast come no mrs upjohn rising and walking away oh dear oh dear deuce take carlton smythe and his supper party those are my sentiments and lal roper busybody that he is things were going on with us as smooth and peaceful as could be before this upset lily raising herself angrily you were in it mother you were as much to blame as anybody mrs upjohn halting ow in it in uncle lal's artful plan to prevent nico from being invited you've confessed you were lal twisted me round his little finger i was clay in the potter's hand as your dad was fond of saying lily changing her position if only nico had been there i shouldn't have given young farncombe all those dances nor wandered about with him in the intervals nor allowed him to see me home it all simply wouldn't couldn't have happened hitting a cushion oh sitting up and embracing her knees mother mrs upjohn behind the settee what lily knitting her brows i i'm so surprised at myself surprised so so disappointed with myself why you haven't done anything that's that's not quite respectable lil on the contrary no i haven't done anything that's actually not nice but fancy mrs upjohn close to lily fancy lily opening her eyes widely fancy my letting myself go with young farncombe as i did he he'd been admiring me from a distance for weeks and weeks but i'd scarcely noticed him till last night leaning her head against mrs upjohn softly i i always thought i was such a cold girl mother in in that way i suppose it was what's called love at first sight lil lily laughing shamefacedly <laughs> putting her feet to the ground and shielding her face with her hands oh don't talk rot mother mrs upjohn moving away anyhow it's not too late lil even now 
Not too late. Mrs. Upjohn behind the center table. To back out, Derry. The captain couldn't possibly hold you to a hasty promise given him between four and five in the morning. Oh, oh, how can you? I've passed my word to Nico, and I wouldn't break it for twenty thousand pounds. Looking up. Mother. Mrs. Upjohn fussing with the things upon the table. Yes. Lily resolutely. I'm going to pull Nico up, mother. I've dragged him down, and I mean to raise him. Clenching her hands. So help me God, I do. Well, you've got a tough job before you, Lil, in my opinion. Perhaps, but I mean to succeed. After a pause. Besides. Besides? Lily, slowly. I've told you, Nico or no Nico, I'm determined. I'm determined not to draw Eddie Farncope into my net. Into your net? Another pause. Lil? Eh? That's twice you've made use of that remark. Who's accused you? There is a lively rat-tat at the door on the left. Come in. The door opens and Jimmy Birch bounces into the room. Jimmy as she closes the door. Ah, ma. Ah, Lillums. Good morning. Jimmy kissing Mrs. Upjohn. <laughs> We've met before, this morning, haven't we? Coming to Lily. Well, dear old girl, and how are you today? Kissing Lily and then eyeing her keenly. A wreck? Rather. I ought to be, but I'm not. Directly I laid my pretty head on my pillow, I went off and never stirred till I found the breakfast tray on my chest. Reckoning on her fingers. Five to six, six to seven, seven to eight, eight to nine, nine to ten, ten to eleven. I've had six hours. That's not so dusty. To Lily slyly. You didn't sleep very soundly, probably. Not very. Jimmy smiling from ear to ear. Excited? Lily shrugs her shoulders. There is a silence, and then Jimmy, still beaming, looks round and sees that Mrs. Upjohn has seated herself upon the fauteuil stool. May I sit down for a minute? Of course, Jimmy. Do. Jimmy sits in the armchair by the center table, awaiting some communication which doesn't come. Mrs. Upjohn drums upon the table with her fingers, and Lily busies herself with rearranging the cushions on the settee. Jimmy, after a while. Hope I haven't dropped in too early. Lily settling her shoulders into the cushions. Not a bit, dear. It's nearly half past twelve. I... I dashed round. After another pause, unable to restrain herself further. Any news? Any... any... anything to tell me? Mrs. Upjohn abruptly. Yes. What? Lil's engaged. Ha! Triumphantly. Ha ha! Clapping her hands and beating her feet upon the floor. Ha 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 ha! Jumping up and sitting beside Lily and hugging and kissing her. Oh, 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 yum, yum, yum. Oh, you humbugs. Rising and rushing to Mrs. Upjohn and embracing her. You solemn humbug, ma leaving Mrs. Upjohn and singing and dancing to the refrain sung in the previous act. Oh, if you would only, only love me. <laughs> if you would merely, merely say. Her voice gradually dying away as she sees that the expression on Lily's face and upon Mrs. Upjohn's doesn't alter. Wait but a little. Standing still. Little for me. Mrs. Upjohn caustically. Yes, you had better wait a little. You better wait till you hear who. She's engaged too. Who to? Lily studying her nails. Whom to, mother? 
Why, isn't it? No, it ain't. It's the cap. The, the cap? To Lily. Nico? Lily nods. Jimmy draws a deep breath. Oh. Lily calmly. Nico turned up here early this morning, while Eddie, uh, well, Lord Farncoe, was with me, in fact. And I, we, the three of us, we talked matters over, and, and... Jimmy, her eyes starting out of her head. Was there a row? Oh, don't be so curious, Jimmy. Poor Nico has been after me for six years. A girl must play the game, if she's at all decent and wishes to preserve a shred of self-respect. Again there is a pause. Then Jimmy silently resumes her seat in the armchair. Mrs. Upjohn moistening her lips with her tongue to Jimmy. How do you feel about it? Jimmy thoughtfully. How do I feel about it? To Lily. May I say? Lily, coldly. Certainly. Jimmy rubbing the arm of her chair with the palm of her hand. Well, if I were on board a ship at this moment, I should be ringing for the stewardess. That's how I feel about it. Lily throwing herself face downward at full length upon the settee. Oh, oh, you're just like the rest of our girls on the question of marriage. You, you, you're detestable. Jimmy sliding out of her chair and kneeling at the settee and putting an arm round Lily. Oh, Lil, Lil. Lily repulsing her. Yes, yes, you are. Raising herself upon her elbow. You'd rejoice to see me draw this boy into my net, wouldn't you? You know you would. Mrs. Upjohn rises and comes forward. I dare say you jolly well wouldn't object to catching him yourself if you'd have the chance. Fiercely. You try it. You try it. You or any of you. Jimmy attempting to rise, scandalized. Oh! Lily holding her. No, no, Jimmy. Lil, I'm perfectly ashamed of you, speaking to Jimmy Birch in that manner. Lily dropping her head on Jimmy's shoulder. Oh! She doesn't mean it. I hope not. It ain't exactly pleasant to have a dog in the manger for a daughter. To Lily. Why shouldn't young Farmcombe turn his attention to Miss Birchprey or to any young lady who doesn't object to take your leavings? Jimmy to Mrs. Upjohn. Hush, hush, hush. Mrs. Upjohn walking about. No, I won't hush. Jimmy to Lily quietly. I'll come back in the afternoon. Lil seems to have got some maggot or other in her brain about drawing Lord Farncombe into her net. Net, indeed. Jimmy, not heeding Mrs. Upjohn, arranges Lily comfortably upon the settee, and then rises and smooths out her skirt, preparatory to departure. As Lal Roper was saying yesterday, our tip-top aristocratic English families ought to be extremely grateful that strong, healthy professionals of the class of Miss Arker and Miss Travail and Miss Shafto are entering their ranks. And if Lil chooses to be pig at it enough... Jimmy makes a movement towards Mrs. Upjohn. Have a bar old ginger beer before you go. There is a prolonged, playful knocking at the door on the left followed on the part of those in the room by a gloomy pause. That is Lal. Lily groaning. Oh. Jimmy drawing a long face. Hmm. Lily to Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy, stay. The knocking is repeated. Jimmy retreats to the right as Mrs. Upjohn goes to the door and opens it. Roper is outside. Roper entering in high spirits. Hello, 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 hello. Embracing Mrs. Upjohn. Morning, Ma. Advancing. Any more bids for the handsome gilt candelabra with the crystal drops? 
to Jimmy. Morning, Jimmy. Looking down upon Lily eagerly. Well, Lil, well, my pet. Lily, in a weary tone, giving him the tips of her fingers, and then turning upon her side with her face to the back of the settee. How are you, Uncle Lel? Roper chilled. Oh, I thank you, Lil. After a short pause to Mrs. Upjohn, glancing at Lily. Not up to much today? Mrs. Upjohn glumly. No great shakes. Dancing too hard, I expect. A deal too hard. Roper, after another pause. Anything else amiss, Ma? Mrs. Upjohn sitting upon the box ottoman to Jimmy, who is at the piano examining some of the music. You tell loud, Jimmy. Tell? To Jimmy, who comes to the settee apprehensively. Jimmy. Jimmy behind the settee, gravely. No, the old Pandora isn't going to score this time, Lal. Isn't going to, I don't follow you. Be plank, Jimmy. Jimmy endeavoring to relieve the situation. <laughs> Nature's taken precious good care of that in my case. Roper angrily. Now look here, Jimmy. A jest is a capital thing in its way. No man has a keener sense of humour than Lal Roper. "'but there are occasions when it's out of place, "'and this is one of them, my dear, "'and if it's not putting you to serious inconvenience—' "'Jimmy also losing her temper. "'Oh, well, then, have it in the neck. "'Lil's declined, young Fawncomb. "'There. "'And when you crack a joke next, Mr. Roper, "'I beg you'll contrive to favour us with a little variety.' "'Flouncing away. "'Because you bore me pallid with your rotten wheezes, and always have done. Roper going to Mrs. Upjohn, aghast at the tidings. Ma. Mrs. Upjohn to Roper under her breath. Won't draw him into her net, Uncle. Won't draw him into her... Jimmy at the back. K-N-E-T-T. -T, net. Mrs. Upjohn pacifically. Jimmy. Jimmy mimicking Roper derisively. Hello, 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 hello. Fresh fish from the sea. Buy him on the beach, buy him on the beach, buy him on the beach. Roper to Jimmy indignantly. Jimmy Birch. Jimmy sitting upon the fauteuil stool. Ha, ha. Roper to Mrs. Upjohn wiping his brow. Of course there is this to be said, Ma. Rallying at the idea. It may be wise of dear Lil to decline Farkham at first. It, 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 it doesn't do for a girl, does it, to appear to throw herself at any man, let alone a young fellow of the position, the, the, the social status. Lily suddenly sitting up and putting her feet to the floor again. Oh, for mercy's sake, cease discussing my affairs in my presence. To Mrs. Upjohn. Mother. Why do you keep Uncle Lal in the dark? To Jimmy. Jimmy, why don't you? In the dark? Yes, Lal. You're flying out at Jimmy over her armless joke. Stopped her finishing. Finishing? Lil's not only refused young farm coat, but she's gone and plighted herself to another individual. Plighted herself? Lily passionately. To one of the best. To one of the best. Roper, stupefied. Do I... do I know him? <laughs> know him? You know him sufficiently to have plotted and schemed to prevent his being asked to the party last night. Jimmy to Lily. Did Lel do that? Did he? Impudence! Roper sitting in the armchair by the center table, quietly. Chays. Nico. Lily firmly. Nico. But the captain was at the party last night, notwithstanding. Jimmy to Mrs. Upjohn. Nonsense, Ma. Yes, Nico managed to get into the theatre somehow or other. And watched you and young Farncombe. And stationed himself under the portico of twenty-seven to see who brought me home. Oh. 
He's always been frightfully jealous, the Captain Mass. Jimmy looking at Roper. Oh, so really it's entirely owing to Lal Roper's interference that matters were brought to a head this morning. Lily, her eyes flashing. Entirely. Mrs. Upjohn joining in the attack upon Roper. Yes, if Lal had been content to mind his own business. And hadn't meddled. And muddled. Things might have gone on much the same as before. And might have ended different. Lily rising and walking away to the right. Ah, uh, no, mother. Jimmy rising and joining Lily. Certainly they might. Mrs. Upjohn rising. Anyhow, I hope it'll be a lesson to allow. Do you, ma? Mrs. Upjohn moving over to the girls. Not to put his fingers into other people's paws. Jimmy to Mrs. Upjohn with a withering glance at Roper. Oh, you are sanguine. Roper rising and straightening himself out. Ma, Mrs. Upjohn, uh, Lily jimmy scornfully hello 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 roper to jimmy Psh. impressively ma lily for years longer than it's agreeable to count i've been a patron of the drama particularly musical comedy of which i studied the development with especial interest jimmy resting her elbows upon the back of the settee Yes, you've studied a lot of development, Lal, in your day. Roper, ignoring Jimmy. It's been a fad with me. I put it no higher than that. Producing his gloves. But I've devoted time to it. Any amount. Roper drawing a glove on. Often to the neglect of my ventures in the city. Here I am now, for instance. Huh, that's obvious. And... I frankly admit it. I've had more than one serious dispute with Mrs. Roper on the subject. Jimmy softly whistles a few bars of Rule Britannia. Yesterday, by a coincidence. Feeling the outside of his breast pocket. Letter from the wife, full of complaints. Haven't been to Bexhill to her and the kids for weeks. And to do Ellen Roper justice, she's not the woman to grumble without cause picking up his hat and cane, which he has placed upon the centre table. Dash it all, home ties are home ties. Polishing his hat with his sleeve. And taking one consideration with another, and after this, this occurrence, it's my intention for the future, my firm intention. Lily returning to Roper and throwing her arms around his neck. Oh, Uncle Lel, not altogether. We're tired and cross this morning. Not altogether. Mrs. Upjohn behind the center table. No, no, Uncle, you mustn't. Lily to Roper. Forgive us. Coaxingly. Mother and Jimmy are cats. Oh. oh! The door on the left opens and Gladys enters with a card on a salver. Gladys advancing to Lily. Are you in? In? Gladys surveying Lily with mingled disdain and pity. Oh, you do look washed out. Lily going to Gladys. Never you mind whether I look washed out or not. Who is it? Lily takes the card, reads some writing upon it, and stands twiddling the card in her fingers. They're in the dining room. Lily to Gladys after a pause. Ooh. Wait outside, on the landing. All right. This won't get my silver cleaned. Gladys withdraws. Lily waits for the door to close, and then walks about distractedly. Oh, why can't they leave me alone? What do they want with me now, both of them? Mrs. Upjohn moving towards Lily. Oh. Nico's downstairs, with Lord Farncombe. Lord Farncombe. And Jay's. Lily reading the card again. Nico asked me to see him and the boy together. Roper and Mrs. Upjohn go to Lily, one on each side of her, and try to read the card. She pushes them from her and sits in the armchair by the center table. I won't. 
I won't. Jimmy joining Mrs. Upjohn and Roper. Yes, yes, Lil, do. Mrs. Upjohn bewildered. What? Perhaps they've arrived at a friendly understanding. Understanding? Jimmy excitedly. And have come to propose that Lil should choose between them. Great Scott! I have chosen. I have chosen. It's settled. Undoubtedly she ought to see them. It's a shame to persecute me so. A shame. Jimmy, Mrs. Upjohn, and Roper behind Lily's chair. Lily! Lily! Lily. 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 Give them a minute, dear. Hear what they've got to say. It would be uncivil not to. Oh, oh. Buck up, Lil. My pet. Uh, to reason, dearie. Lil. 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 Lily. Lily. Lily yielding helplessly. Oh, very well. Ah. Ah. Tell Gladys, when I ring. Jimmy flying to the door on the left. I'll tell her. Roper to Mrs. Upjohn importantly. Lucky I was on the spot. Lucky I was on the spot. Jimmy on the landing to Gladys. Bring the gentleman up when Miss Lily rings. Lily rising and pacing the room on the right. Give me some stockings. Mrs. Upjohn hurrying into the bedroom. Yes, dearie. As she disappears. Maud. Jimmy returning and closing the door, and then whispering to Roper. Bet my boots, that's it. Roper to Jimmy in a whisper. Choose between em. What else can it be? I can't. Jimmy throwing herself into Roper's arms. Oh, if it is. Roper hugging her. Oh. Jimmy suddenly releasing herself. Oh. Haughtily. Thought you were Lily. Mrs. Upjohn returns carrying a pair of stockings. Lily seats herself upon the fauteuil stool where concealed by the center table she draws on the stockings with Mrs. Upjohn's assistance. Lily whimpering. Oh, oh. Don't, dearie, don't. Mother's here. Roper impatiently. I, uh, I think I'll run downstairs and shake hands with Jays and Farncombe while Lily's tidying herself. Jimmy, who has moved over to the right, to Roper. Be careful. I should advise you not to risk it. Roper at the door. Risk it? If Nico knows you were the cause of his being shut out of the party last night, he'll simply throttle you. Roper opening the door. Throttle me? Throttle Lyle Roper? He disappears, closing the door, as Maud enters from the bedroom with a pair of shoes. Lily weakly. Oh, oh, no. Get me something to keep these up with. Jimmy to Maud. Ribbon. Mrs. Upjohn snatching the shoes from Maud. Ribbon? Maud opens one of the drawers underneath the further cupboard on the left and finds a roll of bright new ribbon, while Jimmy, searching among the objects on the center table, discovers the case of manicure instruments and takes from it a pair of scissors. Lily putting on her shoes to Mrs. Upjohn. No, no, that's the left foot. Oh! Don't agitate yourself, dearie. Mother's here. Maud comes to the center table with the ribbon, and Jimmy cuts off two links from the roll. Maud to Jimmy. Morning, Miss Jimmy. Morning. Lily to Mrs. Upjohn. Where's the mirror? Where's the mirror? Mrs. Upjohn taking the mirror from the table and giving it to Lily. Here it is, dearie, here it is, and I'm here too. Lily viewing herself in the mirror and running her hand over her hair. Oh, how horrid I look. Jimmy goes to Lily with two lengths of ribbon, and Maud replaces the roll in the drawer. Ring the bell. Jimmy hands Lily the garters, relieving her of the mirror, and Mrs. Upjohn hastens to the fireplace and presses the bell push continuously. That'll do, Maud. You hook it. Maud going to the bedroom door. <laughs> That's how I like to hear her talk. <laughs> Maud vanishes into the bedroom, closing the door, and Lily, having tied up her stockings, rises and comes to the settee. Mrs. Upjohn still pressing the bell push. Now I don't believe I've wrong. 
lily at the uttermost tension ah uh, stop it mother stop it sitting on the settee we're not calling the fire brigade jimmy at the back of the settee to lily i'll wait in your bedroom till the men have been shown up and sneak out that way bending over lily mind if nico is willing after all that you should make your choice mrs upjohn advancing yes dear if he is willing lily frantically i tell you i have made it i keep on telling you i've chosen i've chosen i've chosen clenching her hands if you torment me any more either of you mrs upjohn and jimmy retreat precipitately to the bedroom door they open the door and then standing in the doorway listen intently jimmy disappearing <sighs> mrs upjohn partially disappearing ah only her head visible speaking to lily in a hoarse whisper mother's here dearie the head is withdrawn and the door softly closed after a pause gladys enters at the other door followed by g's and farncombe the men are carrying their hats and canes gladys retires closing the door and g's comes to lily and shakes hands with her g's to lily gently how are you today lou very fact i am a little g's turns from her to lay his hat and cane upon the box ottoman and then farncombe who has hung back advances hesitatingly to the further side of the centre table and bows to lily she rises and avoiding his eyes gives him a limp hand across the table how'd you do to g's who having got rid of his hat and cane moves away from the ottoman sit down won't you she resumes her seat upon the settee and g's with a nod sits in the armchair by the centre table farncombe remains standing and again she addresses him without meeting his eyes and you farncombe with another bow sits upon the fauteuil stool there is a brief silence and then g speaks lil yes in the first place farncombe wants you distinctly to understand how it is he's committing this breach of his compact with you to farncombe you promised i promised never to attempt to come near miss paradell again nor even to enter the theatre Geez, to lily and if i'm any judge of a man lily farncombe would have kept his promise he'd have kept it faithfully but for me i've brought him along insisted on it emphatically i've brought him along see why nico i'll tell you my dear you remember when we left you early this morning ordering us to walk away together and to part good friends perfectly well we did walk away together and we did part good friends but we didn't part at all till some hours later in his rooms we didn't part till i'd made him stand by me and listen to me while i had a long jaw with my brother on the phone lily wonderingly with your about that rhodesian business what rhodesian business i mentioned it to you yesterday bob owns a third with peter chalmers and tom dalby of a group of farms near bulawayo and he's been badgering me eternally to cut this and to settle out there as their agent and i've accepted old girl lily with a blank face acceptant jeez grimly leaving you to bring an action against me to recover damages for a broken heart drawing a deep breath yes i'm chucking you lil i give you formal notice of my intention and you can drive down to your solicitors this afternoon and instruct them to writ me without delay forcing a laugh <laughs> nico unless unless you've an idea of consoling yourself shortly with with another chap and prefer not to carry the matter into court lily about to rise nico Gee's restraining her by a gesture. Shh! No, no, no. She sinks back. Ah, Lil, Lil, 
I know you're full of generous, honest impulses, though I did tear you to rags in Farncombe's hearing a few hours ago. But I'm not going to allow you to sacrifice yourself to them. I, I, I've come to my senses, and I'm not going to permit it. Bending forward. Oh, my dear, why should I make you pay for the weaknesses of my character? Because that's what it'd amount to. I've bullied you for having played skittles with my life, my career. So you have. Damn it, so you have. But you've done it out of blind thoughtlessness. And if I'd been a fairly strong man, with some ballast in me, you couldn't have landed me where I am. Not you nor fifty Pandora girls. Sitting erect. And that, that's the moral of the tale. And, and... Abruptly to Farncombe. There's nothing more, is there, Farncombe? Farncombe, brokenly. Except that, that I'd like to repeat what I've already said to Jay's, that I... His elbows on the table, his head bowed. Oh, you make me feel terribly small, Jay's. Again, there is a pause. And then Lily struggles to her feet and holds out her hands to G's uncertainly. And at once he rises and takes her in his arms. Farncombe also rises and, standing beside the settee, turns his back to G's and Lily. Lily to G's, choking. Oh, Nico, I can't, I can't. G's patting her shoulder. Ah. Uh. Why, what? What would become of my resolutions? Resolutions? To... to raise you up, Nico. You are raising me up, setting me on my legs again. Lily in a fright. And... and drawing Eddie into my net. Oh, we've talked of that too, he and I. He's given me an account of what passed between you here. My dear girl, your conscience may be quite clear on that point. Nobody can ever reproach you with trying to draw him into your net. They would. They would. At all events, the task you have to face now is to prove to the world, his world, that Miss Paradell is equal to playing lead on a bigger stage than the stage of the Pandora. Holding her at arm's length and shaking her fondly. And you'll do it. Ho, 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 ho. You'll do it. <laughs> His voice dies away miserably, and he releases her. Then, pulling himself together, he looks at his watch. Well, I've got to go to lunch with Bob at half-past one at the Junior Carlton. Lily agitatedly. It's not nearly that, Nico. It's not nearly that. Nico! She passes him, moving towards the door on the left, as if to intercept him and then turns to him. A strip of ribbon lies upon the spot where she has been standing. After gazing at it for a moment, he stoops and picks it up. Oh! He folds the ribbon carefully and puts it into his pocket. Oh! Hitching up her stocking to her robe piteously. <laughs> <laughs> they face one another laughing, and then she sits upon the fauteuil stool, and drops her head upon the table, and he fetches his hat and cane from the box ottoman. Nico! Nico! Gee's coming to her. Oh, this isn't goodbye, Lil, not by any manner or means, my dear. We'll kill the fatted calf several times before I start. You, I, and the boy. Besides, by and by, you and he must take a trip and come out to see me. Serene Javale is the farm where I shall be quartered, Bob tells me. Looking into space. German Street to Serene Javale. Shaking himself. Fuh, there are no great distances in these days. To Farncombe with a change of tone. Farncombe. Farncombe comes forward. You dine with me tonight. Recollect, it's an engagement. Yes. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Kentanis. Kentanis. Without looking at Lily again, Jeeves goes to the door and opens it. Farncombe follows him, and the two men halt in the doorway. 
Gee's to Farncombe with a motion of his head towards Lily. And afterwards you fetch her from the theatre and take her home. That's your job. Lily rising. Oh! Farncombe goes out onto the landing with Gee's and parts from him at the top of the stairs. Then Farncombe slowly returns, closes the door, and finds Lily sitting upon the settee in a woeful attitude. Farncombe coming to Lily and standing before her thoughtfully. Lily. I? Huh? I'm afraid there's one thing finer than winning the woman you love, and when you've won her, being prepared to go through fire and water for her. What's that? Having the courage to give her up, as Jay's has done. Lily with a renewed outburst. Oh, Nico, poor Nico, poor Nico! Farncombe sitting beside her and taking her hand consolingly. By George, he's a brick, isn't he? Lily, after a pause, drying her eyes. Eddie? Yes? If, if ever we marry... Farncombe, his jaw falling. If? When, then? When we marry... You'll be obliged to resign your commission in the guards, won't you? Farncombe snapping his fingers. Psh! I shan't care a rap about that. Lily snatching her hand away. The snobs, the snobs! They'd let you marry any bit of trash in your own set. But a Pandora girl, though she's as pure as the Queen of England. Oh, the contemptible snobs! Farncombe regaining possession of her hand. Shh, shh, it, it's the practice. Blow the practice. A cheerful reflection for me it'll be, the errant snobs. Farncombe stroking her hand. Ah, ah. And then, poor mother. You, you won't be very proud of poor mother. Your mother? Boyishly. Oh, she... she's an awfully good sort. She hasn't an H to her name. Farncombe inadvertently. She oughtn't to have. Lily withdrawing her hand again, sharply. She calls herself Hupjoin, you mean? Farncombe distressed. No, no, no. In a difficulty. Um, at any rate, H's don't lead you to heaven, do they? Lily gloomily. You're right. Mothers lead her to Evan. Rising and walking away. Well, you'd better go now. Farncombe rising. And tonight? No, I'll come home alone. Lily. Please. When? Lily moving to the door on the left. Not for two or three days. Give me time to shake down over this. Farncombe taking up his hat and cane, which he has left upon the center table. Sunday? Lily, fretfully. No. Monday? Lily, opening the door. No. Farncombe joining her at the door. Tuesday? Lily, appealingly. I... all right. Again, he takes her hand, she keeping him at a distance. He attempts to lessen the distance, but she checks him, shaking her head. Not just yet, Eddie. He smiles at her tenderly, and with a bow, departs. From the doorway, she watches him disappear. Then she shuts the door and wanders listlessly to the door of the bedroom. Her hand lingers upon the knob for a moment, and then she opens the door a little way and calls. Mother! Mother! She leaves the door and is returning to the settee when Mrs. Upjohn enters. Mrs. Upjohn, all agog. Yes, Lil? Lily seats herself upon the settee without speaking. Yes, dearie, yes? Advancing to the center table. Have they given you your choice? Lily dully. No, they've given me no choice. Mrs. Upjohn advancing further. What? Nico's going out to South Africa, mother. South Africa? Well, to Rhodesia. 
Then you're afraid, Lel. No, I'm not. Not? Nico... Nico's handed me over, mother. Handed you over? To Lord Farncombe. Mrs. Upjohn gasping. <gasps> and you went the young chap, man? I... I suppose so. Oh! Sinking into the armchair by the center table. Oh, the dear captain! Lily transferring herself from the settee to Mrs. Upjohn's lap. Oh, oh, oh! Putting her arms round Mrs. Upjohn's neck. Oh, poor Nico! Mrs. Upjohn soothingly. He'll have his reward, Lil. He'll have his reward hereafter. And poor Carlton Smith. Oh, poor Carlton. Poor Carlton? He's losing every one of his best girls, mother. Gwenny Harker, Mady Travail, Eva Shafto, and now me. Oh, poor Carlton. Hush, dearie, hush. Don't consider him. Rocking Lily to and fro like a baby. Think. Think what a lot of good you're all doing to the aristocracy. The door on the left opens and Jimmy and Roper look in gleefully and then tiptoe towards Lily and Mrs. Upjohn. End of Act 4 End of The Mind the Paint Girl by Arthur Wing Pinero